Good evening, y'all. Welcome back to another Sunday Night Electronic Bash Fundamentals of Arduino stream. I'm Jeff. You know me. Hi, how are you doing tonight? As always, I've forgotten to start my little countdown timer, so I'll do that now. That'll uh, count us down when we actually get started, just to give our stragglers a few minutes to catch up to us. Uh, if you'll forgive me, these first three minutes are usually like a hello and a little mic check. I'm going to adjust some of the contrast that's going on here, because while I am awfully pale these days, I'm not quite that pale. So I'm going to take just a second and uh, just adjust some of these video settings, because something very strange is going on. Um... Hopefully it all sounds out good out there tonight. If it doesn't, please like, do let me know, because I know that audio is just, like, the least tolerable thing. Oh, yeah, there we go. The gain is set to, like, super McMega high. Let's turn that down a little bit. There we go. That's more of a face and less of a pale, pale ghost. That's great. All right, let's hold there. Um, Here we go and do that. I got my mouse set up correctly this time, which is how clever of me. Hold those savings. Um... Nate! Hi! I wasn't expecting to see you here tonight. Took an earlier train for unrelated reasons, so you'll be here all night. Oh, very good. I had on my list wishing you safe travels, but if you are if you arrive safe and sound, that's fantastic. Chris says, I need a clock for the timer session. Chris is in for the first timer joke of the night. I know there are uh, there are some more coming. Palmer, thank you for the sound notes, as always. That's someone I very much trust. Hi, Travis. Um, do you have a key mapping for my mute button? I turned that mute button functionality off. I just decided it's fine. I can either, like, manually mute the mic using the little, like, click button on my screen in front of me here, or um, I can... Uh, <laughs> I can, you can listen to the sounds of my slurping as we go. Uh, oh, live chat, Chris. Thank you. That was the thing we learned last time when I, it like stealth muted a, an equation Nate was trying to put in chat. That's a, that's a good feature. What else should be on my checklist? Um, make, make do circuits, make do things. Hi Lee. How are you? Um, oh, Lee and Travis being here reminds me, um, tonight I am drinking, uh, a sketchbook, no parking Citra Pale Ale from Sketchbook Brewing Company here in Illinois. A delicious pale ale. I mentioned last week that, uh, <laughs> okay, okay, Travis, that's cheating. So the reason that Travis knows what I'm drinking tonight, I, I mentioned last week that Lee and Travis had dropped off some beer for me, which was really very, very, very sweet. Um, what I don't think I share with you last week is that in, in order to figure out what kind of beer they should drop off, they made a whole spreadsheet of all of the beers that I've ever had on, on the episodes. Um, and since it's a Google Doc, I've started updating uh, what I've put on there. This is one of my favorite things that I've ever I've ever gotten as a uh, as a, as a life tracking document. It makes me it makes me very, very happy. So thank you for that. Um, and yeah, so so 10 bucks to Travis, everyone pay up. Um, I'm going to enjoy a, a, a first sip of this Citra Pale Ale. Um, what are y'all drinking tonight? Again, as always, no pressure. This is not like a you have to drink thing. Um, water is also important, but I'm drinking a pale ale. Well, that's interesting. It's very bitter, but it's also got like a light lemony taste, which I like a lot. Um, mm, super tasty. Um, Nate, you're not, are you, you're not still on a train, are you? You're in somewhere safely, I hope. <laughs> be very exciting. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a good one tonight. I will totally admit. So it's uh, things just feel just a little bit, a little bit weird here right now, only because uh, our uh, our <laughs> our wonderful dog Winnie uh, does not like thunderstorms, and we had one roll through about five a.m. So I've been up for a while longer than I normally would on a Sunday afternoon. So if it seems like I need to pause and regroup at some point, I totally will have some water, have some beer, which always clarifies the thinking and pick back up for what is, as I think I said last time, a little, just a little bit dense of a topic. And I, you know, those of you who were here last week, when we talked about like register manipulation, it's a, it's a little bit dense. And this week is the week that it's going to start to pay off and we can do interesting things with it. But I won't lie. Like it is, it is a little bit intense um, in terms of like, it all it relies on math, holding some things in your head and configuring things. So I'm, I'm super excited about it because timers and counters are a super powerful tool and then we can do cool things with them. Um, but if if this ends up, someone shared with me the other day that like some of the classes are like really good and useful and applicable right now. And some of them are like, oh, I know that that I can do X, Y, and Z, but I'm not going to bother filing away in my head how to do it. I'll just go back and watch Jeff's video again when I need to know how. If that's where you land tonight, that's totally fine because there is going to be like a fair amount of detail because it's interesting and a good learning opportunity. But, you know, all of this stuff lives, of course, here online, lives in reference materials, lives in the slides that are, as always, online at jeff.glass electronics bash. So you can follow along with the slides tonight if that's easier than looking at them on the screen as they go by. Um, also, all the code that we'll be looking at tonight at least uh 
at least code that I wrote in advance will be on the website as well, so you can look there. Nothing terribly complicated in terms of circuitry tonight. Um, I've got an Arduino. It's hooked up currently to an LED. We'll use this passive buzzer later, but that's about all the circuitry we'll get into this evening, I think, unless we, we go crazy. As Chris says, it's uh, the timer has expired, and it's time for timers. So let's, let's just jump in. So timers, <laughs> what are they? Um, I will say, oh, little, little thing right off the bat. So if you're looking at the um, the data sheet, the manual for the AT Mega 32A, which is, as we all know, the microcontroller that's, well, it's under my label here, but it's the chip that is the Arduino in many senses, the actual microprocessor on there. Um, the they are the the technical term for these is timers slash counters um so i'm going to use the word timer just because that's how i think of them refer to them a lot of things are named as if they are timers technically they are timers slash counters and we'll we'll get to the difference in a little bit i mentioned that mostly because if, if this inspires you tonight to go out and keep learning more um you will sometimes especially in older literature see them referred to specifically as counters they're the same thing just getting that out of the way all right, so things we're talking about this evening. Um, timers, obviously. Timer interrupts. You might have guessed from the fact that we did um, fundamentals of interrupts and interrupt registers in the last two weeks. Timers have interrupts that are related to them as well. We'll talk about those. Um, we'll talk about timers and how they are already used with some of the built-in functions that we, we know and love, including analog writes, tone, milli... Excuse me. Ooh, this is a, this is a bubbly one. We're going to have a bubbly evening. Should I, I'm, I'm not going to bring that mute button back. It's just not worth it. Um, milli de delay, servo, lots of things use these built-in timers already, and we'll get to dig into that a little bit. Um, and then how we can use timers to do cool things. Um, so real quick, I'll, so last week was, I will admit, super dense. Like by the end of it, my mouth didn't know what it was saying, so I'm not sure how anyone else was supposed to track it. So let's do a real quick recap as to what we learned last week as to how we use bitwise functions to manipulate various bits. And I'm going to show you a shortcut that I actually learned about in the middle of this past week that I wish I had said in the previous class. So quick, quick recap. A register is just eight bits. It's one byte that lives somewhere in a fixed place in the Arduino's SRAM. In the Arduino's memory, the, the kind of memory that gets wiped in between every time we turn the Arduino on and off. They all have a name, uh, like uh, might be the, the port B data register, and they'll have a short name, like DDRB, MCUSR, and so on. They'll have an initial value. When you boot the Arduino up, almost all the values default to zero. All of the bits in one of these registers have a name as well. So like down here at the bottom, you can see a, a random register that I ripped right out of the data sheet. It's the port B register, and its bits are port B0, port B1, port B2, and so on. And the bits are numbered from least to most significant, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Again, this is all just recap from last week, but good to refresh ourselves on just, just a little bit. All right, when you hear register, just remember that's a byte somewhere in memory that means something. Right. So here's the thing I should have showed you last week. Right. Where we got last week was here. Right. How do you um, make a bit in a register one or clear it to zero or flip it? We talked a lot about these bitwise operations where we or something with a one to set a particular bit. We and it with a zero to clear it and we exclusive or it with a one to flip it. Hopefully this is this is feeling a little familiar from last week. We also talked about this BV macro that's equivalent to one left shift by an amount to generate some numbers that we can and and or with our other our other various bits. Let me show you, I didn't know this literally until like four days ago, the Arduino library now has a built-in function to, to do some of these things that's a little bit more approachable. Um, that is the bit write and bit read functions. Um, so if you say bit write uh, a register or a variable, which bits, 0 through 7, you want to change and what you want to set it to, a 0 or a 1, that is sort of the same as a lot of these other operations, right? So you could say bit write DDRD, DDRD2, like the, the second bit there, the name of that second bit, set that to a zero, please. Um, port D, bit port D4, or like, you know, could just say, you know, number number four, number five, set that to a one. Um, if I wanted to read the value from a pin, I could use this bit read function to read, say, the, the sixth bit in this register. Um, I don't regret at all going down the nerdy pathway of learning all that wise math last week, because honestly, we are still going to use it quite a bit. Um, but if all of that felt a little bit opaque, and I don't blame you, um, these bit write and bit read functions are really easy ways of manipulating the bits inside of uh, a byte or a register. Um, but in, in any case, we still will be using some of these, uh, B, the BV macro especially, um, and the or and the and to set and flip bits, but that's just a little bit of a, a, little bit of a shortcut if it's helpful. Um, 
And so just like a, a, a real quick example of how you might use either of these functions to manipulate the bits in a register. Again, this is just a random register that I yoinked out of the data sheet, just literally did a screen cap and plopped it in. So it doesn't really matter what it does, but let's say, for example, we needed to set this bit, the bods bit to one. A couple ways we could do it. We could say, we could take the whole byte and uh, do an or operation with the bit value of the bods bit. So that would generate the value that has a one only in this place, it would or it with the existing value in the register that would make sure that the bods bit is set to one. We could also do this super handy new bit write function that I assume lots of people knew about. I, I just didn't. Um, you could do bit write MCUCR bods one. Um, similarly, to set something to zero, we can do either an and equals with the uh, the negation of that bit value. Say if we wanted to clear the IV select bit, um, we could do this and equals negation of BV IV cell, or we could do bit write MCUCR IV cell zero. I will totally admit for these these simpler examples, the bit write and bit read versions infinitely more readable, <laughs> right? Like uh, I'd like there, I think there's no contest. Like, and to be fair, like I, I, when I look at these bits of code, the or and the and and stuff, I under, sort of understand them. This is not a bragging moment. I feel a little highfalutin saying it, but like you just start to get used to this construction or equals something, oh, we're turning something on and equals not something, oh, we're turning something off. But if this is the first couple weeks you're seeing this stuff, the bit write commands will work just as well. There's not a direct way within the Arduino library. There's not a bit flip command, but you can probably think about how you would use a bit read and a bit write together to change the value of bit from something to something else. Um, we can also use the command that's currently uh, currently hidden by that. There we go. Um, we could exclusive or the current state of the register with uh, with a bit to with a one bit to flip a specific bit. Cool. Any any quick catch up questions on bitwise math and registers? Um, for those who weren't here last week, the, the gist of it is sometimes you know within these these eight bit registers, we have the occasion of wanting to to set a particular bit to one regardless of what it is now, to clear it out to zero no matter what it is now, or maybe flip it from whatever it is to to the opposite state zero to one or one to zero. And these are various ways of, of doing that, if that sort of makes sense. Um, but do do follow up with questions because we will continue to use this stuff tonight. Um, I think I used the analogy last week of like last week was the two towers of this saga where you know, we're going to have to spend some time in the ant wash, like wandering through the forest. We're going to have to learn about the history of the ants and the trees. Um, like, where did Orthanc come from? So that when we get to Return of the King, which is this week, we understand why it's important that the Huorns come out of the trees and, you know, sort of tear down the industrial complex. It sort of gives it weight and purpose. And so this week, we're going to give weight and purpose to a lot of the uh, the nerdy math that we did last week. Um, I'm going to see if I can... St I love these Lord of the Rings metaphors, so I I'm going to try and stick to them. They're probably wrong. But but uh, I think they're I think they're fun. All right, let's get into it. Timers and counters. So like I say, timer slash counter, same thing in our parlance. Because really, um, you know, a counter like like this little thumb clicker down here, like you'd use at the entrance to say like an amusement park. Um, what is a timer but a counter that something is pressing at regular intervals, right? So in a context where um, those those counters are being advanced to sort of at a constant rate, um, we can think uh, that those um, are, are timers, essentially. Uh, uh, we can also use these same um, counters. I'm, I'm running out of words here. This same pile of numbers, when we're not sort of triggering them in a regular metronomic fashion, they could be used to count individual events that are some coming in from the outside world, and they'll work just the same. For our purposes tonight, we're mostly going to be using them with sort of timed, regular metronomic <laughs> is a word I, I, I don't know if I've made up, but like you get what I mean. A source that acts like a clock. Um, so same thing. Just, uh, just two different, slightly different ways of using them. So the timers that are in an Arduino, we're finally there. We did it. We made it. Timers that are in an Arduino, you get three timers. They are named timer zero, timer one, and timer two. Timers zero and timer two are eight-bit timers. So like any other eight-bit value, they have a minimum value of zero and a maximum value of 255, right? So two to the eighth minus one. Um, timer one is a 16-bit timer. Um, so you get values from 0 to 65,535, which is 2 to the 16th minus 1. Um, the short names for them, and ones we'll see quite a bit, is TCNT0, TCNT1, TNCT2. It should be TCNT for all these, but 
typos. So that just sounds for timer counter zero, timer counter one, timer counter two, or at least it would if I could spell timer counter zero. Um, and like I say, they can either count from sort of the system clock, which normally for our purposes runs at 16 megahertz. That's sort of the default value in the Arduino world. And we talked a few weeks ago when we looked at like moving the Arduino chip off of the board that you can actually run these microprocessors at various other speeds. Like you could slow it down to eight megahertz or two megahertz or even slower than that. Um, but for our purposes in the Arduino environment, we usually assume it's operating at 16 megahertz. Um, so we can, oops, we're over here. So we can, um, we can have these timers sort of be triggered from this 16 megahertz clock, or we can use something called a prescaler to slow them down. So here's a couple, a couple little details on, on all of that. Uh, this diagram, it doesn't have actually a whole lot of information. I just want to drive home the fact that these counters are just, again, like any other register, they're just bytes that sit in memory. Timer zero and timer two are one byte each. They just, there's a seven, eight bits that live somewhere in memory. Timer one is two bytes long. It's a 16 bit timer. So there's a a lower byte and an upper byte. And if you want to address them individually, they can be TCNT1L low, TCNT1 high, or you can just think of this whole thing together as TCNT1, right? Timer one. They're just things that sit in memory somewhere that we can manipulate like anything else if we want to. Um, and here's like a rough diagram of how these things are working. So we can either um, have these things triggered directly from the system clock at 16 megahertz, which means that every, you know, 16 million times a second, every time that little crystal oscillator swings up and down, the value in each of those timers that we've configured to be on will increment by one, right? So uh, you could hook up timer zero to the uh, the system clock and we increment by one 16 million times a second. We could do the same thing for timer one or timer two. Um, they will then, you know, overflow very quickly. Um, you know, timer zero only only has 256 possible states. So if you're counting up 16 million times a second, uh, it will quickly get to 256 and reset itself back to zero and then count up to 256 and then back to zero. Many thousands and thousands of times every second. But that might be something that's useful to us. And we'll see uses for these in just a sec here. I should say, as always, ask questions, throw it out. If you're like, what, why, what does that mean? Or Jeff, you're not making any sense. Or um, what would happen if, or what happens when all great questions to ask. There's not nearly so many slides this time as there usually are, and not nearly so many, well, there's a fair number of demos, but like, we have we have space, we have air this week if people have questions about how things are working. Um, I am not a timer expert. I'm, I would say familiar, um, but if there's stuff that's like, what would happen if you did this? I'm happy to give it a try. Anyway, digression aside, um, so that's one option for driving these timers is we could run them straight off of our little crystal oscillator at 16 megahertz. Another option is to use what's called a prescaler. And we can select the options for this prescaler differently for timer zero, for timer one, for timer two. We basically have the option to divide each of those timers by each of the, each of the incoming clocks by a certain amount before we put it to the timer. So we can say, hey, instead of you know having the system clock at 16 megahertz, I like to uh, have a slightly slower rate. I like to divide it by eight first, please. Um, so instead of clicking over at, at uh, 16 million times a second, we click over at two million times a second. This little diagram down here, which I, I keep hiding with that little pop-up menu, <laughs> um, is sort of a quick look at like what that looks like on the output side. You can see the clock IO line, you know, moving here very quickly at 16 megahertz. And when it comes out of the prescaler, in this case, in this drawing configured to be divided by eight, it just clicks one eighth as fast. Um, so the timer increments one eighth as slowly. The prescaler options are divide by, in general, are divide by eight, divide by 64, divide by 256, and divide by 1024. On timer two specifically, you also have the option if you want to divide by 32 or divide by 128. And the choice of prescaler really is about the trade-offs between um, sort of resolution in time and resolution in numbers. Maybe it's really useful for us if we're only, oops, only working with events that are moving by really, really quickly and we want to use these timers, as we'll see in a sec, to, to count very small increments of time. Maybe we don't want to divide this at all. But maybe we're trying to measure events that happen over, you know, several hundred milliseconds. We want to slow things down some. Then maybe using a larger prescaler is useful to us so that we can, you know, have, the, have these timers count up not, not quite so quickly and overflow less often. The reason that timer two has these extra prescaler options is that timers zero and one trade them actually for this cool thing. You can choose to drive those timers slash counters from 
an external input. So you could say, hey, these T0 and T1 pins, and I'll show you where those are in a second, whenever those go from low to high, I would like that to be what triggers counter zero, timer zero, or timer one, um, as opposed to using any kind of internal clock. This is really useful for things like um, feeding in data from external sources where you're not entirely sure in advance what the clock rate will be, or it might drift a little bit, or it might be, you know, waiting for a sequence of, um, you know, 13 incoming pulses uh, from a specific signal line, and then we should start listening on it for some data. Um, so it might be more useful rather than having sort of a predefined series of, um, of speeds. Maybe we want to sort of have these counters count individually from external events. Chris asks, is there a flag or something to know when it goes over besides the number being reset? Can you count the number of times it rolls over? Ah, you certainly can. Um, yes, is the short answer. I will get to that in just a little sec here. Um, and, and timers rolling over is actually a really useful thing for them to do. Um, and it's something we can do cool things with. Um, that's excellent. There you are. Excellent question, Chris. Um, so in addition to multiple ways of clocking these timers, right, different ways of, sort of de determining how quickly they count up, um, there's actually a number of different ways in which we can sort of have them count. The simplest, though, the one we've been talking about so far is literally in the, in the manual just called normal mode, right? It counts from its minimum value to its maximum value and then resets itself back to zero. So if it's an 8-bit timer, that's zero to 255 and then back to zero over and over again. If it's, uh, if it's a 16-bit timer, that timer one is, counts from zero to 65,535 and then drops back to zero. Totally easy. Just to give a little illustration of this, I want to do a quick a quick software demo. Um, this will be what did I call this demo? <laughs> to look at my own look at my own website to figure out what did I call this thing. Uh, this will be the print timer demo here at Jeff.glass slash electronics bash, um, which is going to be a very, a very simple bit of code here that we can look at together just to sort of start getting um uh, a little sense of a handle of what's going on in these timers here. It's actually got some code commented out that we're not going to use yet here. So all this code is, is in my setup function, I'm going to start the serial terminal. And then in my loop function here, I have a very simple, oh, I should zoom in so you can actually see what the hell's going on. There we go. That's a little better, huh? Um, in our loop function here, uh, all we have is if, this if statement, if millis mod 1000, right? So if the remainder divided by 1000 is zero, print out whatever's in timer one right now. And by default, all the timers are hooked straight up to the system clock, no prescaler, they just count up forever. Um, so notice this may print multiple times every time this goes through, because I may get through this loop in less than a millisecond, right? I could be at, say, 6,000 milliseconds, so millis mod 1000 is zero, print this thing out, come back to the top, it might still be at 6,000 milliseconds. So we will probably get several prints per time through this loop. Um, but let me upload that to my, my Arduino here. I don't think I need to show you the table for this. So it actually won't be anything to see. Um, but if I open up my serial monitor here, um, which again is doing this weird scaling thing, but I think my baud rate is right already this time because I'm very good at what I do. <laughs> um, we can see that our timer here is just is basically counting up arbitrarily um uh, you know a handful of values every time it rolls past that zero mark um no rhyme or reason it's it's basically wrapping around over and over and over again um many thousands of times per second even though we have 65 possible 55,000 possible values for what this timer could hold it's counting up so fast that like it's counting up much, much faster than we could ever sort of hope to see in our loop here. Um, so, but just, you know, just to, just to demonstrate that this, the, the, the timer counters, um, the counter registers are just places in memory. We can get their value. They, they increase on their own and they have some useful values in them. Of course, I'm only sampling them very occasionally from the Arduino's point of view, sort of, you know, every second or so. So nothing useful there yet, but just to show you, it's just a, a value that lives somewhere in memory. Um, so, um, what can we do with them? Well, to Chris's question, here's one useful way to use a timer, um, is that the timers have interrupts associated with them, um, which you, you might have guessed from all of our, our interrupt shenanigans. I guess I said that there were interrupts associated with them on that very first slide, so maybe not a terrible surprise. Um, but you get two different flavors of interrupts associated with each timer. Um, you get two what are called OCR interrupts. I'm going to put a pin in those and come back to them in a second here. And you get an interrupt called the timer overflow interrupt, which is an interrupt that, if you enable it, 
triggers when the timer overflows, when it wraps around back to zero. Um, it, the, uh, the configuration bits for these various timers live in the, uh, the timer mask registers for each interrupt, the TIMSK registers. So you have a TIMSK zero for the, for uh, counter zero. You have a TIMSK one for timer one and a TIMSK two for timer two. And they have three bits. They have this timer overflow interrupt enable bit, the T-O-I-E bit. And then you have a, you have these other two bits that are related to this OCR compare interrupt that I, we're gonna get to in just a second here. Here. But we can use this timer overflow interrupt enable bit to basically send ourselves an, an interrupt when the timers overflow. So let's do that. Um, this will be the next example from, from our website examples if you're playing along at home. Um, I think it's called, what did I call it online? It's something different here. It's called the, the print timer interrupts section of the website. Oh, that's, that's a disaster. Print timer, print timer interrupts. <laughs> so we'll look at that example next. Um, again, it has some commented out code that's, you know, We'll get to in a little bit, um, but you'll see all I'm doing here. So in my setup, in addition to starting up our serial terminal so I can get some data back, I'm going to enable my timer output, uh, my timer overflow interrupt by uh, setting the bit corresponding to that interrupt, TOIE1. I'm going to set that to 1 in my TIMSK1 register by ORing it with BV1. I could also do, these are exactly the same thing, I could do bit write. Tims, uh, TIMSK1, TOIE1 to 1, right? Set this bit in this variable or register or what have you to this value, this this uh, this 0 or 1 value here. Make sense? So I'm going to write it this way because this is what I'm comfortable with, but they are literally exactly the same thing, right? So if I upload this to Arduino, and hopefully I haven't made too many typos, right? Upload our serial, open our serial monitor here, and we'll see that now every time our, uh, our counter rolls over, our timer rolls over from 65,000 and something to zero, it's going to be printing something out of the serial terminal. And what I've done is said, you remember this ISR function that was how we determine what's going to happen when that interrupt happens. I've said, okay, I want to have an interrupt service routine associated to the timer one overflow vector so the the overflow uh trigger for timer one and again vector just means you know like in math a, a number a place in memory um say hey this is the place in memory what that we're supposed to jump to for our code when this timer one overflow happens when that happens print out the current time from millis in my serial terminal and we'll see that's exactly what it's doing and I'm doing it many thousands of times a second. Uh, maybe not many thousands, many hundreds of times a second. So the time is advancing, of course, at one second per second, which is a good sign. Um, but the, the numbers are being printed out in sort of hundreds of times a second. Every time that timer overflows, we're printing out new numbers. It's actually pretty easy to figure out how fast it is counting, how long the delay is in between each. And let me show you that because it's a useful thing a useful thing to do. And I do it in Google, my favorite calculator. Um, let's see how well this, is, this zooms in, I suppose. Let's get to our actual Google here. Um, so what I will do is say, uh, what is uh, the, so the, the clock speed of our Arduino is 16 megahertz. So if I do, I think if I just do it in Google, and I, I know this is super zoomed out, there we go. One divided by 16 megahertz will tell me that the the duration in between each click of a 13 megahertz cycle is 62.5 nanoseconds. So that's the little tiny slice of time in between each of our clock ticks. Um, so I know that's that's my stretch of time, and it's going to take me, since I have two bytes, two to the 16th of those, so 65,535, but I'll just write two to the 16th of those before my timer rolls over, right? And that'll calculate for me, it's rolling over every just a little bit over four milliseconds. So I'm getting about 250 prints uh, to my serial terminal every second. Um, since there's a thousand milliseconds in a second, it takes about four milliseconds for this timer to roll over. I'm getting about 250 prints to the serial terminal every second. And I might be a little bit blocked because of course the, the serial print itself takes a little bit of extra time. So I might not get that full 250 in there, um, but that's that's the idea anyway. Um, so Chris, that is, that is the simplest way to respond to something um, that is being triggered by the timer overflow, right? Is to assign some a function to an interrupt and have that interrupt do something. And like we talked about last time, you could either have that interrupt to do something directly, like I am here printing something to the serial terminal, toggling an LED, what have you, um, or you could set a flag, you could set a Boolean variable that says, hey, 
it's true. It's time to do something now. And then somewhere else in your loop, when you have, say, a little bit more time to do something, right? Let's say you are using your timers to write something to an SD card, which takes, you know, several hundred milliseconds at best, which in Arduino terms, you know, in terms of things measured in nanoseconds, is ages. So your, your, uh, your interrupt might say, hey, uh, it's time to write to the SD card. I'll set the is time to write to SD card variable to true. And then later in my loop, when I'm sort of not doing anything else and I have a little time to spare, I'll go ahead and actually do that loop. So setting the flag and doing something later are a pretty common way to do things. Um, so that's just a really simple example of how you can use uh, timer overflows to trigger something going on uh, in your interrupt. And of course, if we were to use that prescaler, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit, this would, would slow down significantly. In fact, um, let me, I, and I, I know I'm jumping ahead and I explained it, but what I'm going to do just for the sake of demonstration is uh, uncomment a little code in this example that's going to configure, I think, our 1024 times prescaler. And I will upload that just to give you a sense of how much slower that is. Oops. Not that much slower. <laughs> but now we can sort of we can see the individual numbers go by. So we're still rolling over very quickly, uh, but not quite so quickly as we were before. Let me make sure I didn't, didn't goof this up, but I don't think I did. Let's just make sure, let's uncomment that as well. There we go, did that upload? Yeah. Ah, uh huh. Yeah, this is good. I did. I did have to do this other line of code. So now you'll see, rather than updating, you know, sort of thousands of times a second, I get an update about every 4.2 seconds. Um, that's sort of the longest time we can measure by by hand with these timers, as it were. This is actually this sounds more right. So this was the this was the time it took this 4.096 milliseconds. How long it took for the timer to overflow, running at that full 16 megahertz? Now it's going to take 1,024 times longer, which is just over four seconds. There, that's sort of the slowest amount of overflow time our timer can by itself track. You can see I'm getting, you know, I'm still printing millis. I'm still printing our milliseconds function to the screen here, but I'm only getting a printout about every 4,000 milliseconds. Um, so neat. So, and I will explain how to configure those prescalers in just a little bit. I just wanted to show you sort of what they do to the to the interrupt process, and that it really is taking that long for these things to overflow. Cool. Questions so far? So a, a timer is a register that counts up. We can configure whether it counts up at full 16 megahertz or we can scale it down. And I, I know I haven't shown you how to do that yet. Um, and when it overflows, we can trigger an interrupt to um, to do things with. Cool. Questions? I'm muting myself manually and sipping my beer and then I will unmute myself, I swear, and we'll carry on. All right. Again, as always, ask questions. I'll be here. <laughs> it's so, it, I mean, you know, by now, you've, lots of you have been here for weeks and weeks and weeks. It's so tricky to figure out how to do like question and answer, like the, the checking with the class period of the night, um, just because we're not, we're not live and the lag is such that like, it's like, oh, there's no questions. All right. I'm, oh, there's questions. I don't mind that at all. So I'm just going to roll with it. Shout out the question. You can shout out questions from like weeks ago. If you want to talk about like battery chemistry again, always happy to. <laughs> All right, so that's timers uh, and timer overflow interrupts, which is fun. We also have this thing that I sort of glossed over there called the output compare interrupts. And we actually get, excuse me very much, uh, we get two of them per timer. So for each timer, 0, 1, and 2, we get an A interrupt and a B interrupt. And they each have their own individual enable bits in this register. We have the OCI, OCIE 0A, so the A interrupt for timer 0, and the B interrupt for timer 0. We're going to end up with a lot of numbers and letters in here because we've got multiple timers and multiple things, but, you know, when you when you start to sort of piece them together, all right, I mean, I know I'm working with timer 0, I want the A interrupt, so that's going to be the OCIE 0 bit, uh, 0A bit to, to enable that. Those interrupts will trigger when the timer is equal to the values stored in the OCRA and OCRB registers. You get two of these registers per timer, just like you have two interrupts. So timer zero has an OCRA, so OCR0A and OCR0B. Timer one has OCR1A and OCR1B. Timer two is OCR2A and OCR2B. These are what's called the output compare registers. Um, 
and they are super useful in dealing with timers. The name output compare sort of only captures one of the things that they are sort of used to define, um, but they are sort of the main configuration and, and comparison register that we're going to use uh, when we when we talk about our timers. So in various modes, they're going to do various different things. But basically, we have sort of a couple of places per timer to store a number to do something with. Um, in case you go digging, I also want to say this is this nomenclature was a little confusing to me when I started out with it. Um, if you wanted to say, you know, I want I specifically want to reference the A register of timer zero, that might be OCR zero A, right? Easy enough. For a lot of these things, they're going to be true of any of the A registers of any of the timers. So I might say, and I, I've, I've tried to avoid this wherever possible because it is a little bit jarring. Um, you might say that uh, I'm looking at the OCR NA register. So I'm not specifying a number in there. It could be any of the A registers for any of the timers. And similarly, you know, if I wanted to refer to um, either the A or the B register, I could refer to it as OCR, another typo, OCR 0 X, right? It could be zero A, could be zero B. So that would be the timer, the timer zero A register, the timer zero B register, right? This is places like I want to just tell you that like these are the properties of any of these OCRs, not just a specific one. Again, just to, because it's in the data sheet all over the place, that's what that nomenclature means. Um, and like they're they're super useful little registers that hold points of interest for our timers. So let's talk about what that means. They are just registers in memory, like anything else. Timer one and ti or timer zero and timer two, of course, they are one byte. Timer Timer one, they are two bytes. It's a 16-bit output compare register. There's a, an A and a B for each timer. Um, and they have their own interrupts associated with them. Um, so what you could do is say, uh, trigger an interrupt whenever the timer passes a specific value. Um, so let me show you what that would look like. This I don't actually have a pre-prepared example for, but I will gladly make one up right now. So. Let's see. So let's use our pre-existing uh, prescaler, um, and we'll write a new a new interrupt for it. Um, so, so this is the same program we were literally just running, right? So it's counting up slowly. We're getting the buffer overflowing about once every four seconds. And in fact, just to clear up what it's doing, um, I'm gonna add a little information to my serial print command down here. I'm gonna first say serial print um, overflow at time and then have it print the millisecond. So let's let's just look at that real quick. Um, just because if we start adding things, it'll start to be a little bit more clear where our various messages are coming from. So take a few seconds for that first overflow to happen. There we go, it overflowed at about, about 4.2 seconds or so. Then it does it again and does it again, capiche? So what I'm going to do in addition to uh, enabling this overflow, I'm going to enable the uh, compare A interrupt for timer one. Now I could do this in a couple of ways, right? I uh, Timsk one, that timer control register equals BV. Uh, let's see, what is the name of that interrupt? I, think I put the, here we go. Where is Timsk one? OCIE zero A is the, is the name of that bit that I want to enable there. OCIE one A, right? For the, the output compare interrupt on timer one, and I want to use the A interrupt. We also have a B interrupt available, right? So I could write it like this. I could also just add an or state to my first line. I could say BV OCIE one A up here, right? Or I could use another bit write statement as well. These two lines will do the same thing. I'm probably just going to do it on two lines just to, uh, to keep it a little cleaner here. Um, so I'm going to enable that output enable interrupt, and then uh, I'm going to define another uh, ISR to surface it. So this one's going to be the timer one comp A interrupt, and I just say vect so it knows that's a place in memory to look. And when it does this, I'm going to say serial.print um, comparison interrupt at, and then I'm going to print the time in millis. That, that occurs. Um, we talked last time a little bit, but just to say the millis function doesn't increment during an interrupt, but you can still call it. It's just that the millis function itself is based on interrupts under the covers, and we know that interrupts don't run during other interrupts, but you can still ask it for the current time if you want to, right? So so about two interrupts here, one when it's overflows and one when our comparison happens. And to make that comparison happen, I'm going to need to set the uh, the register that holds my sort of comparison value, my OCR, to a value. Let's set that to 
Uh, let's set it to something right in the middle of its range. Let's say uh, zero, uh, let's say eight, zero, 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 about halfway through its range. Now, hopefully I haven't made too many typos, just the one. Oh yeah, having a semicolon helps. And that compiles, so we'll upload that. And now when I open my serial monitor, and again, it's possible I've made some typos, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, uh-huh. So now we'll see, oops, <laughs> she can get the line breaks right. What's happening there? Overflow at time. Oh, I need a print line statement down here. We'll update that as well. And then we'll see that we start getting comparison interrupt, overflow interrupt. 2000, 2000 milliseconds later, comparison, and then overflow. So what's happening here? That timer is still counting up from 0 to 65,535, uh, or it put it in hex from 0 to FFFF right? Um, that's the, the maximum value of a 16-bit number. When it, Whenever that timer passes by this value, uh, hex 8000, which is about 16,300 and something, he can't say off the top of his head. Um, whenever the timer passes by that value, because we've enabled this output compare interrupt, we're triggering an interrupt there. And then when it overflows, we're triggering the overflow interrupt. Then we wrap around back to zero and we know we're gonna hit that comparison interrupt again, and then the overflow interrupt, and the comparison interrupt, and the overflow interrupt, right? So if you have events that are sort of happening in a regular sequence of time and happening in relation to each other, this can be an, a nice way to structure that. So for example, I have my comparison interrupt happening sort of in the middle of my timer, but let's say I always needed to, let's say, have a series of events happen where um, one variable was always set just a little bit, just a few milliseconds before another one, right? I could set my compare register here to something really close to the sort of high end of my range. Let's say FF00, right? So my timer is going to be basically you know, almost full before that output compare register interrupt happens. And then my timer and my overflow interrupt is going to happen sort of very shortly after that. So we should see... Let's see if we still got this happening. Yeah, uh-huh. So now, do you see that there? We got the comparison and the overflow. Comparison, overflow, comparison, overflow, right? So a difference of about 16 milliseconds that separates each of those events. So this is a really simple way to start sort of structuring events that need to happen really close in time. Um, some examples might be um, using a laser or sonar range finder where you want to emit a pulse and uh, with the with the receiver turned off so you don't damage it, but very shortly after, turn the receiver back on so you can listen, say, for whatever sonar is coming back to you. You could have your your comparison interrupt trigger uh, trigger your your sending side, and then very shortly thereafter, turn on your receiving side. And those would always happen in a very strict time relationship to each other based on these comparison interrupts. And like I say, you get two of these per timer, right? So enable the B interrupt here or equals BV OCIE 1B, right? And then I could write an ISR for that. I mean, let's clarify that this is our comparison A interrupt. I'm just gonna copy and paste that and say the comparison B interrupt happens at some other time. And of course, this will be timer one comp B vector um, is the place that we'll live at. Um, and then we'll need to set whatever that OCR register needs to be. So OCR 1B equals, um, I don't know, something let's say toward the beginning of its range. How about 0, 0300? 0, 0 upload that. And now when I open my serial monitor, what we should see once things get rolling here is we'll get a, we'll get a comparison A interrupt near the end of our range, our overflow interrupt. And then shortly thereafter that we'll get our comparison B interrupt. So A overflow B, A overflow B. They will always happen in that order and they will always happen essentially in the same time-like relation to each other. Timers continue to increment even when another interrupt service routine is running. As long as the clock on the Arduino is running, the timers are ticking up. Um, so this can be a really nice way of structuring things that need to happen in a regular relationship in time. Quick, quick questions on that before we carry on as I sip the beer. I should also peek and see if we have more. We might have another demo I'm supposed to do here now. I didn't do a great job notating that in the slide, so I will take a look at that as well. Um, so let's see, as always, ask the questions and I will take them as they roll in. Let me see, did I mean to do a demo here? I'll take a little peekaroo. Uh, print timer, wrap around, blink interrupts. What is this blink interrupts program? I wrote a lot of programs this week and I, uh, to be honest, I've written, I don't quite remember what all of them do. <laughs> 
Um, oh, yes. No, well, not quite there yet. We need to learn a little bit more about our various interrupts. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Question break, aka <laughs> everyone drink. You can, you know, you can hydrate along with me uh, whenever I ask a question. Uh, you can, uh, you, or whenever I'm asking for questions, you can assume that I'm just, you know, interested in some beer. Maybe I don't actually care what you think. Maybe I'm just trying to find an excuse to drink IPA. That's not true. It might be true. When I actually remembered to unmute myself this time, so I'm very proud. It's going great. Um, where were we? Output compare interrupts. Ah, okay. So for what it's worth, this is the little list of all of the interrupts you get that are related to your timers. So like I said, you get an overflow interrupt, a comparison B, and a comparison A interrupt for each of the timers. You also get, just to mention it, uh, a neat little interrupt for timer one only called the uh, input capture event interrupt, which basically saves the value of the timer to a variable for you. We're not going to get into it tonight because it's kind of niche, um, but just so you're not confused by what this timer one capped thing is here. But this is just to drive home that each of these three timers has three possible interrupts it can trigger, the overflow, comp A, and comp B. Um, so this is all in normal mode, right? So our, our current conception of a timer is that it's going to count from zero to 255 or 65,000 and change, and then reset back to zero every time. Super useful way to use timers. Let me show you another way. Uh, another mode you might put the timer into, it's what's called clear timer on compare match or CTC mode. Um, so the timer will be cleared when the timer is equal to the OCR A register in that case. Does that make sense? So looking at our looking at our previous graph, our normal mode graph, right, the timer is always going to count up to two, let's say 255 in this case, then drop back to zero, then go up to 255, then drop back to zero and so on. That's in normal mode. In CTC mode, in clear timer on compare mode, the timer is only going to count up to the value that's in our OCRA register, which might be something less, right? So we have a, something, a higher frequency of counting, if you will. So if this OCRA register was set to only say 100 instead of 255, we're counting up to 100 and then back to zero, up to 100, back to zero, up to 100, back to zero. This is a way of influencing sort of the frequency at which our uh, our, our overflows happen, if that makes sense. And of course, if we have an interrupt happen in the middle at some level on this, this increasing section, it will also happen more frequently. So this is where, <laughs> this is where the next demo comes in. Um, this will be the blink interrupts demo if you're playing along at home. Um, and again, I haven't, I haven't shared yet how you configure these prescalers, and I will do that in just a second, I swear. Um, but just to show you how, you know, how you might use, um, I'm going to use this as an example that's not using that, uh, that um, CTC mode, and then I will show you an example that does use the CTC mode. That's very similar. Um, so we're just gonna be blinking an LED, classic, we're gonna blink the, an LED, I think on port, what's B5, is that pin 11? Let's look that up. I love that my, my slides have become, pin 13, oh, it's the built-in LED. Well, that'll be really useful. Um, I'll plug that in there. Um, so all this code is gonna do uh, is going to enable my overflow interrupt to make sure that my LED pin is an output. And then when my when my timer overflows, I'm going to toggle that LED pin. I'm going to do this or this exclusive or operation. I'm going to toggle that LED pin on or off, all or on or off, um, every time that that, uh, that timer overflows. So upload that code there. Chris has a question. Does it start with zero? Yes, it does. So um, the every time the timer resets, it will go to zero. Um, so for example, and, and the, the step that it matches the comparison does count as a single step. So if you said, you know, reset on compare match and your comparison value was one, you would go zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and so on. Just to show you what I can guess, you can already guess is happening down here. Um, I have my, my timer is overflowing once every, I think about four seconds. I think I have this maximumly scaled down. And when it does, we toggle that LED on or off, right? Same as our serial examples over, uh, from earlier, nothing terribly fancy going on there. Um, but let me show you a slightly modified example using this CTC mode. Um, this is the blink interrupt speed example, if you're playing along at home. So uh, again, setting up the LED, as an output. Um, 
and I am using some control registers to set up CTC mode, which I will, I will explain in a second, but let me show you what happens so you have a sense of what it's doing, and then we'll show you the, the registers where you set this up. Um, the thing to take away here is that I am setting the OCR1A, the OCR A register, to this value, something small-ish, you know, about a, a third of the size, a quarter of the size of uh, the maximum value of this register, and then I'm going to enable... Uh, I, I just don't actually need to enable this this uh, this compare interrupt, but I will. Um, and I set in CTC mode. So whenever this timer reaches this value of uh, hex three 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 three, right? So that's out of a maximum of hex FFFX, right? So much much lower. Every time it hits that, uh, I'm going to trigger the fact that my timer needs to reset to zero, and we'll jump back to the beginning. Um, so what I should see is rather than waiting about four seconds uh, for things to uh, sort of cycle through as we're as we're doing on the table now. Things should get quite a bit faster. So let's upload that code, and we'll see if we've goofed anything. And hopefully, yeah. So if we come to the table now. We'll see we're blinking quite a bit faster before than before. And of course, if we come to our serial monitor, we'll see similarly things are going significantly faster. Now, if I change the value that's in the OCR one A register to something even smaller, let's say you know hex. 1000 upload that right now that that's uploaded we'll see we're going faster still because it's taking a lot less time for our counter which is still counting at that same speed as when the timer was moving slowly we're still counting at the same speed whereas instead of waiting for that value to get to 65,000 we're now waiting for it to get to say a thousand or you know whatever uh hex 100 is that would be what uh 2000? 2048, I think? Somebody can check the math. Oh, 1024, it must be. Somebody can check the math on that. You get the idea, right? We're, we're instead of stepping that timer all the way up to its max value, things are going up just a little bit, resetting, a little bit, resetting, a little bit, resetting, right? So we sort of now have a way of not only controlling with our prescaler the speed at which those numbers are increasing, but sort of limiting the top range, which allows us to create some sort of some shorter, some tighter cycles for how these timers are used. Um... So let's see here. Where, where, what slide were we on? Mm, yes, here we are. So that's CTC mode, clear timer on compare match mode. Um, and then the the last mode that is is sort of useful and interesting to us is what's called fast PWM mode. Um, and what this does is we're always we're back to our version where we're counting from zero to our full value, so zero to two fifty five, say. Um, but there is a built-in functionality in the AT Mega 328 to turn some pins on and off for us without us having even to write interrupt registers for them, right? Um, what we do is basically we configure some bits to say, hey, when your value is uh, below a certain value is stored in one of my registers, turn a specific pin on, and when it goes above that value, turn the pin off. So let's look at the red pulse width modulation signal down here. That's being directly driven by this timer. We've configured it with some value in one of our registers, let's say the OCRA register, right? Whenever the value in our timer is less than that, the pin is on, and as soon as it goes above that value, that pin turns off. Then, right, then our timer keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, resets, right? We're back below that value, so our pin turns on, turns on, turns on, turns on. Ah, we're above that value, pin turns off, and waits for that timer to reset. And by setting these two different registers, the OCRA and the OCRB, differently, we can have different duty cycles of pulse width modulation. This, in a very real way, these the presence of these three timers, each with two possible OCRs, two different control registers for them, is the reason that you have six pulse width modulation channels on an Arduino, right? One, one of the limitations I see people running into is like, oh, I wish I had more PWM channels to do, but I only have six. Why are we limited to six? And it's because you have three timers and each of them can hook up to two specific pins on the output um, and to, to do this, this exactly this pulse width modulation thing. This is also why those pulse with modulation pins are on specific pins of the Arduino. You know, there's some things we can do with any pin, right? We can digital write, we can analog read, we can do all these things, you know, from a variety of pins. Um, but there are only specific pins that we can use for pulse with modulation. And it's these ones that have, do I have a weird sneaky animation? I do. It's these ones that have this designation of OC1A, OC1B, 0A, 0B, and so on on our extended data sheet here. You'll see that those correspond to pins 356, 
9, 10, 11, which are exactly the Arduino pins that have pulse width modulation capabilities. They have that little squiggle next to them, right, that we know and love. Um, and it's because those pins, those physical hardware pins on the chip are physically tied into these control channels on these timers. So they're able to, to do these functions to toggle themselves on and off as these timers increase and then turn themselves back on when it wraps around to zero and turn off at a certain level. That's a hardware functionality. That's not actually happening in code anywhere. We're making use of the built-in functionality of these timers to do that pulse width modulation, right? Nerd tangent aside, interesting fact. Um, so, oh, and just to say, so it, what we're used to think of, we used, what we are used to thinking of as pulse modulation is this lower example here where things are mostly off and then a little bit on, or we want to define how on they are. You can also set these things up in inverting mode where they, the amount that you are determining is how long they are off rather than how long they are on per cycle. Same idea, just if, you, if you're digging through the data sheet, and by the way, I encourage you to dig through the data sheet on these things. You learn a lot. Uh, it's really, it's really, I mean, it's, it's a little bit... It's good to start getting into um, if you're interested in learning about these things. Um, but uh, if, I put a link to it in the description of this video. It's the ATmega 328 data sheet, and it has a lot of sections that I mean, literally everything that we're talking about tonight, all the various registers, all the you know what what bits and bytes do what. It's all just in the data sheet, and you just look and you say, okay, well, go to the table of contents here. What was that thing he was saying about timer one, and it had some registers? Ah, okay, here's some control registers, and here's what they do. So the data sheet is where I'm not. I'm, I don't. <laughs> I didn't invent any of this. It's just all in the data sheet. So if you if you ever have questions, you now or you in the future watching this video, the data sheet's a good place to look. Anyway, um, so we have we have our three primary timer modes. We have our normal mode that counts from zero to its full value, then resets. We have our CTC mode, our timer, our clear on timer compare mode that resets at some smaller value that we can control. And we have our fast PWM mode that always comes up to the top and is manual, sort of automatically in the background turning some pins on and off for us to do pulse with modulation. There's also a thing called phase correct PWM mode that first counts up and then counts down. There's not a particularly strong use for it in what kind of things that we're doing, but it's in the, the dead sheet if you uh, if you discover it. Um, so like I say, these are the, the six pins, the three, five, six, nine, ten, and eleven that we can use for pulse modulation. And they are sort of directly hooked to these various timers uh, to to do things with. Um, so we can use them for, for pulse modulation if we want to, but we can also use them for, for other things. Like, I'm going to show you a demo before I get to the control register parts, because honestly, the control registers, we've already talked about what they do, so the details of how they do it are, are probably a little dry. So let me do a fun example first before we get there. Um, what I'm going to do, uh, if you're playing along at home, is open up the, what did I call it? The uh, tone interrupt demo. That'll be a fun place to start. Before we look at the code, I'm just going to double check what pin I said I should hook things up to. Uh, PB1 is pin 9. Great. All right. So I'm going to wire up here on the table. I'm going to hook this here passive buzzer up to pin 9 on my Arduino. Um, passive buzzers 4, 3? It might have been week 3, um, which would have been like early April. Um, so in other words, like sometime um, during the Visigoths period, I want to say. That might, it might as well have been in another era of history for how, how much time is working right now. But that's all right. Um, so I've hooked up my passive buzzer here. You remember our passive buzzer, buzzer modules have an input and an output side. The input side is going to go to pin 9. The output side is going to go to the ground the ground pins on our Arduino there. I guess I haven't tried making sound on this new microphone now, but given how much it seems to be picking up my lip smacking, I think you're going to hear this buzzer just fine. Um, I'll mute the music that's... Uh, that's you know, jiving in the background when we uh, when we get to the point of uh, making beeps and boops on this thing, as I show you what we can do with it with interrupts. So let's say a quick peek at this code. Uh, we've got a pin defined where our uh, our buzzer is hooked up, and you'll remember from last week that our pin names here, right? In addition to the familiar Arduino pin names, zero, digital zero, digital one, digital two, and so on, they have these internal names that are based on the actual, sort of the internal names of the ATmega 32H chip based on a series of ports, each port having up to eight pins attached to it. So what we would call digital pin, say, seven, is actually PD7 inside the Arduino. Digital pin 13 is on port B, pin 5, PB5. And if you look at these extended um, extended pinouts, extended uh, 
pinouts pinouts i guess is what i'm looking for um you can find that their internal names for them which will just be useful for us in, in manipulating them internally right so going back to our code here so our, our buzzer is hooked up to port b pin one which we can see from our extended data sheet is is the same as what we call digital pin nine right uh, i'm going to make it an output you recall by setting the direction register to have a one in that location so that'll set that up as an output again i swear we'll get to talking about these control registers here um, and then i'm going to set my uh, my OCR register to, uh, you know, a middling value, say a thousand again. Um, and, oh, I actually, ah, uh-huh, yeah, cool, that's right. I was like, where's the rest of the code? That is all the rest of the code. I told you I wrote these a few days ago. So, so what's happening here? So these control registers, which we'll look at in a second, are setting up our, uh, our, our, timer one to be in this CTC mode, in this clear on timer compare mode. So whenever the timer reaches this value in the OCR 1A register, it's going to reset back to zero. So rather than counting all the way up to OX FFFF, it's going to count up to just, you know, 1000 and then reset back to zero. So I've set it into CTC mode and I've also set up this little bit in here, which is uh, a configuration option we have that says every time you reset, toggle the the uh, pin associated with timer one actually we have two of them toggle the first pin associated with timer one right so timer one comparison a pin zero every time i reset i want you to just toggle that pin for me right and the rest of this deals with slowing down the clock a little bit here so i actually didn't need to write any interrupt code this literally is the five lines is the entirety of the code i'm going to say hey i want you to clear this timer every time i hit you know one zero 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 and every time you do turn that buzzer pin on or off so let's see what happens i'm gonna mute the music for this let me let me know if you can hear this we'll upload that oops we'll upload that i say come back to the table Ooh, problem up well <laughs> well there's your problem drink uh now we'll upload our code and hopefully can you hear that if i i think i can see it on my meters if you can yeah that seems to be i would i would guess audible <laughs> I hope it's not too, too, too awful. Um, but so that, that buzzing is happening sort of independently of any code that we're, we're, we're running, right? The fullness of the code is just this. We set up, Hey, reset that timer every, you know, every time we get to here. And when you do toggle that pin on and off. So if I, if I change how fast that timer is resetting, I change the frequency of that buzzer, right? Now we're, we're quite a bit lower because we we changed our timer value to be higher so it's going to take longer to go through until we reset if i make it smaller right let's say arbitrarily we'll set it to zero boo we get a higher tone right if i go even higher let's make an even shorter delay right <laughs> And we can go up from there. Zero, I don't know, zero, six. And just to be clear, like what the, the variable that we're incrementing, oh, that's awful. I don't know if you can hear that comes through on the mic, but it's like, yeah, it's gross. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. Uh, no, I'm just going to unplug it. <laughs> I thought I had a clever solution. No, I'm just going to unplug it so we don't have to listen to that awful sound. Um, so this is a really cool feature of these timer interrupts is they have these modes where you can sort of hook them up directly to pins and then you can uh, then you can use them to sort of toggle things to do PWM, to toggle a pin, to drive a buzzer sort of automatically without having to jump to any additional code to do it. We're making use of this hardware module, this what they call the waveform generation module um, to do these things for us, which is pretty cool. Um, to show you sort of a, a, a little a broader example, um, to jump to the next example, if you're playing along online, this is the tone interrupt serial example. Same exact thing, except that I'm going to set the frequency using the serial port right so setup is the same make our tone pin an output uh you know start our serial port uh, configure my various configuration registers that i i you know it's interesting i put these i, I put the the information on those configuration registers earlier and then i realized it's kind of bookkeeping right the interesting thing is not what bits do what the interesting thing is what they do um so we will talk about that just for the sake of fullness but you know for the time being you can trust me that we're configuring things to do things. Palmer says, what wave shapes can I generate sine square? Ah, everything that we're talking about tonight is a square wave. In fact, um, here, let me show you this demo and then I, I have a thought. Dangerous. 
<laughs> too many thoughts. Um, so all I'm going to do here is setting up in that same mode where every time that timer overflows, it will toggle the pin on or off. Um, and uh, when it's ready to start, it's going to say, I'm ready to receive integers and play tones. Thanks. Thanks, Arduino. Um, and then in my loop here, right, so the, the turning of that pin on and off, the playing of the tone is automatic. It's happening in the waveform generation module. Um, but in my loop, I'm going to say, if I have something available at my serial port, um, I'm going to try and read it in as an integer. And if it's in the appropriate range that I'm expecting, I'm going to set that register, that register that's controlling what, um, controlling how long it takes for that timer to overflow and come back. I'm going to set that to the value that I'm sending over the serial port. So if I upload this, I don't know why I, I bothered to start the music again. We're just going to come back to playing, playing awful, awful tones here. Oh. Oh, it's bad. Let's up. Let's upload something. Let's get rid of that. Upload. Upload. Upload, you fool. Please upload. There we go. Whew. All right, we're back to we're back to this joyous sort of vibratory noise here. Um, but now, if I open a serial port, right, it says, "Oh, I'm ready to receive integers and play tones." So if I say, "Oh, I'd like to set that uh, set that value to." Uh, 1000 and because it's not a frequency yet that's just literally how high the timer can get before it resets so it's gonna be a thousand times the time step that it takes for that timer to increment by one so if i shorten that time to 500 i know you can't see the numbers i'm typing in because they're small but i'll say it as i go if i make it 250 it's quite high if i make it 2000 it's quite low right or 1500 or 600 or 4000 Right. And we're sort of by we're just changing how long it takes for that timer to overflow. And that's going to influence how rapidly that uh, that buzzer is turning on and off and change the the sound that we hear. Does that sort of make sense? The sort of track. Um, so what I what I think I can show you, though, um, is to show you the actual waveform that's being generated as we do it um, using ye olde oscilloscope here. There might be a brief moment of tummy cam required to make this happen, um, but I was doing this was I was sort of troubleshooting the demos, um, and I think actually it might be kind of an interesting thing to show um, as we talk about um, how these interrupts are um, triggering the various uh, <laughs> functionalities within the uh, within the Edwin. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> Wow, what an interruption. Happy interruption, everybody. Uh, some of you may know me. I'm not here every week. My name is Mary Hungerford. I'm Jeff's partner and wife. Uh, and I just thought I would contribute to this week by telling you about my own craft beer story, which is what you're here for. Tonight, I'm drinking a Chicago handshake, which is a shot of Malort and a nice, clean, crisp, old-style lager. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Have fun. <laughs> I was well warned that this was going to happen. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. <laughs> but I didn't know when. Oh, uh, that's very good. My wife is tremendous. She's fantastic. Uh, she's had this on her radar for like a week and a half. It's been on our, our calendar, our whiteboard calendar on the wall. That's been great. <laughs> anyway, thank you for, for uh, thank you for being here. It easily the best. Literally, the the calendar on our wall says July nineteenth. Interrupt. It's pretty good. Uh, yeah, I'm a lucky guy. Where were we? Oh, I was gonna do some shenanigans with an oscilloscope. I think we can all we can continue to bask in the glow of that moment as I set that up. And I I'm gonna have to do a little webcam chicanery to make this happen. Um, but let's get this oscilloscope hooked up here. I'm just gonna hook it up across my buzzer here so I can see the waveform as it comes out plug that in then i'll start making a tone it's gonna it's gonna have to do a little i didn't i didn't plan to do this so it's gonna be a little bit of a kerfuffle i'm gonna have to readjust the gain on this uh on this here camera but let's see what happens so if i go to this view that we haven't seen in a long time yeah there we go yeah so there's the oscilloscope so let me turn the time value up here so we get multiple multiple square waves and make that a little taller and bring it down. There we go. Let's make that a little bit bigger. Yeah, so that's the that's the voltage wave. That's the literally the voltage uh, across our buzzer here on the table, right? So that is um you know the when the 
the voltage is low at zero volts is there. When the voltage goes high to five volts, we go there. Um, and it's doing that. We can see up here the current frequency. It, it thinks the current frequency is about two kilohertz. Um, it has a real hard time with the counting of this because you can see how dirty this waveform is because it's going across this really capacitive buzzer. So what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to use my cursors um, to measure the actual width of one of these waveforms. I think that's going to tell us a little bit more accurately. Delta. Yeah, so I don't know if you, you probably can't see down here, but it says delta uh, 82 hertz. That sounds more right. Like if you listen to this tone, that sounds more like 82 hertz than it does two kilohertz, I suspect. Um, but if I come over to my serial port here and I say, you know, please have a delay of, you know, in my units 500. Oops. Why did that not do a thing? Let's reset and see. Let's start again. Ah, uh huh. There we go. So you can actually see how. Let's come back down to sort of waveform sizes that we can see here. I'll adjust my time, my time span here, so we can see what's going on, right? So let's say we'll start at a. Let's see, what's a reasonable tone? A thousand, right? So now if I go to eleven 1 hundred, see that square gets a little bit wider, and if I go to twelve hundred, a little wider still, and thirteen hundred, and fourteen hundred, and fifteen hundred, and sixteen hundred and so on, right? So in principle, Palmer, I guess the answer is these are, these are nominally square waves and this overshoot and undershoot has to do a lot with the physical properties of this piezo buzzer, right? That's what's causing these, these giant spikes here and this, this way undershoot here. Um, but in theory, it's just a square wave. Um, you'd have to get pretty fancy. You'd need an actual um, DAC, a DAC, to create something more like a sine wave or at least an approximation to it. So let's, let's unplug that there. Uh, that's getting to be a bit much. Um, that demo actually worked better than I thought it was going to. Let me turn that camera back around to here. Uh, if you disconnect the buzzer, will the reading clean up? Um, let's find out. I, I didn't get too far in moving the camera, so this works out really well. Um, let me plug this back in. Let's pick a reasonable... Let's actually... I don't I don't know what, what the worst possible tone is, but this one is not too sonically unpleasant, at least here in physical reality with me. Um, let's actually... Let's find those frequencies where it was really really squanky. Squanky being a technical term for um, has a lot of overshoot and undershoot. All right, let's adjust that time variable. Right, so that's that's a pretty awful waveform. So if I, if I disconnect the buzzer, what I get is something that looks, oops, let's go back to measure. Something that looks more properly like, adjust my scale here a little bit. Something that looks more properly like a square wave. Now, it, you know, in principle, this is not a great... I mean, we talked about this back in, in um, voltmeter days, I want to say, when we were talking about the fundamentals of electricity. This is not really a great way to do voltage measurements. You never want to measure across something that's floating like this. You want to be measuring across a resistor or across a load or something like that. Um, what's happening here is actually that the... Uh, Arduino itself is ground referenced through my computer because my computer is plugged into the mains power source and the ground lead of my oscilloscope here is also ground reference. It's connected to the ground through its power cord. So these two, I'm actually not measuring, you know, across this little air gap. I'm measuring the distance from a common ground to this voltage. If I were to float one of the other of these things, think it might not be as successful a measurement. I wonder actually if I unplug my computer's power. Well, I'm not going to unplug my computer's power supply because I, I think it's going to do weird things to the GPU. PU and the stream will go squidgy. Um, but yeah, so you can see when I plug this buzzer back in that the, the physical mechanical properties of that buzzer are responsible for all that dirty waveformness. Yeah, interesting. Um, a piezo buzzer, you know, essentially it's, it's got to move a little that's the camera, move a little, you know, piece of metal in there by applying and unapplying a voltage to it. So the fact that it's that physical piece of metal is sort of ringing back and forth as that waveform is being applied, I suppose, isn't isn't terribly surprising. It's interesting too, I mean, you can sort of see that the the effect there is frequency dependent, right? If I if I lower that frequency some, right? You can see it sort of shoots way up here and then stabilizes um, to a, and then shoots back down and then stabilizes again. It's kind of interesting. All right, let's let's unplug that again. We'll come back over here. So a a brief <laughs> a brief bonus demo tangent, but uh, but I'm not sad about that. We should we can oscilloscope some more stuff if we want to. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. So Palmer, nominally, the Arduino is outputting a square wave, right? It's it's going zero, five volts, zero, five volts. Um, and as we, you know, if we take if we take this, you know, uh, buzzer away or replace it with something that's more linear, like a resistor, then yeah, we see that classic like zero, five volts, zero, five volts. Um, let's see here. Where was I? I don't remember. But I'm not sad about it. That's a cool demo. In fact, when we do some more of these things, we might want to plug that oscilloscope back in. So I'm not going to take that camera too far. Um, oh, well, okay. So here, this is good. We've done some We've done some interesting, fun oscilloscopy stuff. Let me redo my little masking here. Ugh, ugh, sorry. <laughs> um, let's talk just a little bit about the control registers that you use to set this stuff up because they're useful. And then I have some more demos for us that'll sort of drive home how these things can be used. Um, so some bookkeeping. Each timer has two control registers. They call them A and B. They have a variety of bits that control various things. Um, they have three WGM bits each, which are the waveform generation mode bits. And that's what's controlling whether we're in normal mode, we're in this PWM mode, we're in our CR clear on timer compare match mode, um, or our fast PWM mode. We have our phase correct PWM mode, which again, we're not really talking about. Um, and you, for each of them, you can see you know, the normal mode counts from zero to its top value is zero FF. In uh, timer compare mode, our maximum value is the value in the OCRA register and so on. And it gives you some specific technical details of where it's updating the various flags that trigger the various interrupts at, just so it's totally clear what's doing what. Um, you'll see we have two of those WGM bits in this register. The third is in the other register we'll see in a sec. But you basically you say, okay, I want to be in CTC mode here. I'm going to set bit WGM01. One, two, one, piece of cake. We also have these, these com bits here, these comparison output bits here. That's what we use to set up our various, you know, are our pins going to automatically toggle themselves on or off when something happens? Um, so in normal mode, we can have them uh, toggle or turn themselves on or off in our non-PWM mode, in our PWM mode. And, and again, I guess I'm kind of just breezing through this because as I'm saying it out loud, like these are good things to know that are possible, but like I don't expect anyone to like memorize where the control bits for each of these things are. I mean, I'm not going to. I'm going to look it up in the data sheet even if I had to do this next week. Um, so just some things to know that are possible. Um, if you want to, we want to get really into learning about these settings bits, we can, but I sort of suspect that's not the chief flavor of this thing. Um, so again, so these, these compare bits in PWM mode configure, you know, uh, for example, like, like we're not automatically toggling bits if they're both off. If we turn on just this first bit, uh, we're going to turn off the output, uh, at the match at the top, uh, and then, uh, turn it on at the bottom. That's going to be sort of our non-inverting mode. So it's going to be, uh, on, 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 on. And when it hits that comparison, it's going to turn off, right? On, 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 off. Right? And the other way is sort of what we know as basic PWM. Uh, it's going to be off, 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 on, off, 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 on, and so on. Um, so anyway, control registers let you sort of, con these, these control bits, these COM0, COM1, A, and B bits control whether the pins are automatically doing things in the background for you, like we saw with our buzzer example, like we saw with our, um, uh, well, with our buzzer example, <laughs> with our blinking example in the background there too. Um, oh, we should talk just a little bit though. This is this is a slightly more interesting one. Timer register B has the uh, the, you know the third waveform generation module bit, but also the prescaler control, right? So uh, if you want to set up your your clock for these timers to run slower than sixteen megahertz, this is the register you do it in. I guess you look at this table and you say, okay, um, do I want my clock to run at normal speed? Okay, I'll set that this bit, the CS00 bits to one. Uh, do I want it to run at, at eight times slower? Uh, this is the combination of bits I set, all the way up to 1024, um, which is our, our slowest possible uh, prescale. This is also where we configure if I want this timer to be manually triggered from an outside source, either on a rising or a falling edge. There's bit combinations for that. Or we can stop our counter. We can say, hey, I don't want you to increment at all. There might be a situation where during some particular mode or operation, um, the easiest way to stop various things happening, or maybe you want to pause, just sort of pause a specific timer in the middle to investigate it for troubleshooting, you can set some bits that actually say, hey, timer, just don't, don't ever increment. Just stay exactly where you are whenever I configure this value. Maybe useful to you in some situation. Um, 
what did I? Oh, so th this is just to show the the pins that can manually increment your timer. The T zero pin for timer zero, the T one pin for timer one are connected physically again to ti to pins four and five, what we would call digital pins four and five. Um, so if you want to manually increment counter zero, timer zero, you have to connect digital pin four. If you want to manually increment timer one, you have to connect to pin five. And again, that might be for something like um, accepting in an external signal source um, uh, that's going to have, you know, uh, every 256 pulses of this external clock line, I need to you know, change the state of one of my LEDs, but it's under external control. Um, I don't want to do, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what frequency exactly it's going to come in. At. I'll just let this sort of automatically count as this line goes up and down, if that makes sense. Um, mm. Super important point before we get back to a couple a couple more demos. Um, timers are, are sort of the, the building blocks underneath a lot of functions that we already know and love. Um, they are used for the millis function uh, to so increment a, a, an internal variable that counts that number of milliseconds that have been since the program started running. And its companion, the micros function. Um, the delay function is built on top of millis, actually. So it also is at the end based on timers. Um, the servo library that's you know generating a pulse every you know uh i don't know every few milliseconds that's a certain width wide you think back to our, our servo example the way that a, a servo is controlled a little hobby servo motor is that if the, it's sending a regular series of pulses if the pulses are wide we're rotated all the way one way if the pulses are narrow we're rotated all the way the other way well that's a perfect task for one of these timers right you configure one of your sort of registers your ocr register to say i want that to be sort of on the lower end i'm going to have my bits automatically turn on and off so that my pulses get narrower or maybe i adjust my value to be on the higher end of my timer and my my pulses are longer and so on um, used by the tone function, which we sort of replicated here a little bit to create tones and buzzes and things. The timers are also all used, as we talked about, for the analog write, the pulse width modulation functions on the Arduino. And this is all to say, so like this is, you know, both a good example of how powerful the timers are that you can use them for all these things. And also a cautionary tale that if you are using timers to do things manually and setting them up in different ways, you will start to screw with the various um, built in functions functions that rely on these timers being set up in the way that they think they are. So for example, um, in, in our example that we just ran, what timer did I use? Timer one, I think. Yeah. So I've messed with timer one here to, to do this, you know, making obnoxious tones demo. Um, by doing that, that would mean that my servo library would uh, not necessarily work the way that I intended it to. Um, because I, maybe I've set up the prescaler differently. And so time is working in a different way in that timer. Maybe that library is directly relying on one of those output compare matches that like it's counting on, you know, being able to trigger and interrupt and control one of those control registers itself. And now I've taken that over to do something else. So it's not that it may, it may not stop working, but it may not necessarily work in the same way that I want it to. This actually is the case, even if you're not manually manipulating timers, and you may have run into this before in your, in your nerdy adventures, y'all you nerds out there, you good good nerds um because things like the servo library uses timer one and pulse with modulation on pins nine and ten uses uses timer one you actually can't do them both at the same time um if you are using the servo library uh, analog write to pins 9 and 10 won't work at least as intended. It often does something, um, but depending on exactly what you're doing with the servos, it may not do the thing that you want it to do. I actually ran into this very recently, um, didn't even think about it, but um, I'm sure you're sick of me talking about it, but I have this little tiny moving light project, which has been a lot of fun, and it has some servos in it, and it uses pulse with modulation to dim this LED. Um, that worked out fine, uh, but then in the last revision, I put a little tiny indicator LED on the board and hooked it up to a digital pin on my ATmega328. It was like, I would, you know, it's probably useful to have a little extra indicator LED before I don't know what, you know, maybe when it gets signal in, the LED turns on and when it loses signal, the LED, you know, it's just nice, nice to have an LED on board that you can use to debug things with. Um, or if I don't feel like hooking this up to the full external emitter, maybe I just want to have an onboard LED that I could, could dim and, sh and show me the status of the dimming without having to wire up the whole thing, right? Here's the goof. I put... Uh, that digital pin on pin nine. Uh, and I also am using the servo library. So when I tried to, as a test, do some analog dimming on pin nine, analog write pin nine to some value, it wouldn't. It would turn on or off 
but it wouldn't dim. And that's because I was overloading my use of timer one here. So just be aware as you're playing with these timers, or if you get into playing with these timers, um, that by reconfiguring them, you will start to sort of mess a little bit with some of the built-in functions, which often is fine, right? If you're not using a servo library, or you're not using PWM, blow these timers away, do whatever you want to. Just know that in the background, these are some of these things that these timers are being used for in the Arduino built-in library. On that note, let's do a couple more fun demos. Um, this will be, let's see, what demo was supposed to come next? It's so great that like Jeff made this website uh, where he tracked all of the order of things because then I can go back and look at what I was supposed to do and in what order. Let's see, I did tone interrupt serial. Oh, let's do tone list. This will be fun. So this will be the tone list demo from the website if you're playing along at home. Um, let's see, pull that up here. Um, it's going to look like quite a bit, but I swear that it's not. Um, the basis of it is exactly the code we were just running with our little buzzer on the workbench here. And I'm going to plug that buzzer back in before I forget. Um, and so sort of to start in the middle, this is actually going to be an example that uses two separate timers to do two different things. Timer one, our 16 bit timer is going to be set up exactly as before, right? Same prescaler. It's going to Whenever it overflows, it's going to toggle. Uh, whenever it hits that compare value, it's going to reset. It's going to toggle that pin. So I, I still basically have frequency control of that buzzer using timer one. And I'm going to use timer two for a slightly different purpose. Every time timer two overflows, so I'm using this overflow interrupt here on timer two. Every time timer two overflows, I'm just going to use that to increment a variable. I'm just going to say, hey, um, I've passed a chunk of time as defined by that interrupt. And the reason I'm, I'm using this to increment a variable variable rather than sort of timing things manually is when I was experimenting with the the values of the prescaler and the fact that timer two can only count to 255 I just couldn't get a long enough increment of time you know I wanted to be measuring things in you know hundreds of milliseconds and even if you slow the input clock to timer two way down you just can't count that high so I said okay well I'll slow it way down and every time that interrupt happens then I'll increment a variable and I can sort of count loops through this this timer overflowing I can use that to do something if that sort of makes Makes sense right so timer two is just ticking off some time uh, and every time it does uh, every time the, the time period goes above a certain indexed value that I'm pulling from an array above, I'm going to sort of advance through my array. You should download this code and play around with it if you want to. Hook up a buzzer to pin 9 um, and have a good play. Um, but essentially, every time I, I sort of overflow the sort of next time I want to do something, uh, I'm going to both step through a next place in my array, and I'm going to change that value that I'm overflowing at in timer 1. So essentially, I'm going to change the frequency with which that buzzer is but that buzzer pin is toggling. Does that make sense? So, uh, you know, timer timer two is just sort of keeping a clock running and telling me when I should be jumping to the next frequency that timer one should be playing at. In other words, I'm writing songs. Um, so if I come up here and I say define scale here, let's plug in the Arduino, upload that. Ugh, awful sounds happening already. It's a good sign. And I get a little C major scale. Um, <laughs> that's pretty fun. Actually, this is kind of cool. Let me turn this camera around again. Oh, really need more cameras. <laughs> he said not not needing more cameras. Ooh, not that. No, we're not done. No, don't go away. <laughs> um, here's our oscilloscope again. And you can see as those tones change, the square wave gets shorter and shorter. Right? Because that's what it means for a a tone to get higher in pitch is the frequency of that pitch, the, the, the period of each of those those waves of that pitch decreases, right? So real quick, for those who are curious, stop. What's happening in the code here is up here in my scale list, I've defined an array where every other value is a frequency. Oh, you can't see me because you're looking at the oscilloscope. Maybe you don't need to see me, but there I am anyway. Um, every alternating uh, <laughs> uh, number in this array is a frequency, um, and then every other number is the number in milliseconds to delay um, before we go on to the next frequency. And all of it, I've defined this this variable called en to be 500 milliseconds, just like as a as a default value. Um, so all I'm doing is playing through the numbers. 262 hertz, 294 hertz, 330 hertz, and so on in a C major scale. And I've written some code in my loop here that says, you know, every time I overflow, uh, jump to the next index in that loop. And I have to jump up by two, of course, because you know, just, you know, every alternate value is a frequency 
and a length. Um, and then if I overflow, if I go past the maximum length of that array, just go back to zero. Um, so that's all that code is. And that's playing a, a fun little scale song. But what if instead of doing that, I undefine, I comment that out and I define Tetris here. Problem up. Oh, I got to plug the board in, Jeff. So I'm going to do a whole week next week that reminds me how to plug the board in. That should have been week zero. Let's speed that up a little bit. I mean, you can probably already hear what's going on here, but that's a little fast, huh? <laughs> I gotta tell you, I had a real good time with this one. And if we look back at our oscilloscope here, of course, that square wave is still oops, still changing in, in real time with the tones coming out. And actually, there's kind of an interesting thing there. So in the uh, in the Tetris song here, the way that I made it have a rest is you'll see there it goes. It almost goes to a solid red color. What I've done is is just say, hey, instead of like trying to turn that pin off, just play a tone at thirty thousand hertz above the range of human hearing for a certain amount of time. And that's the same with me playing silence essentially. So you'll see, at a few points, it goes to like just a, a solid red screen up, up higher than a human hearing oscillation. Little little cheat there. So that's fun. <laughs> so that's a thing you can do with, oh, there's so many of me. Uh, that's a thing you can do uh, with interrupts, right? So we're, we're using one interrupt to, uh, to play our notes, right? to toggle that pin automatically. We're using another to keep time. And you could, you could replace this with the millis function, right? You could do this, you know, you could do something that, you know, checks in a loop in a millis function. Um, it says that if the time is greater than something, then advance to the next period in the array. Totally possible, but we're doing it here with interrupts just to sort of separate it from the millis function a little bit. So if we needed to start, you know, messing with how that timer worked, we would still be keeping accurate time, if you will. One of the other cool things about doing this with interrupts and sort of not putting this into that, that sort of classic structure that we know so well now, is that sort of like check if the baby needs attention or, or I metaphor was um you know what was the last time i checked on the baby has it been long enough that i need to check on the baby again then go check on the baby this uh, interrupt analogy is the baby just cries when it needs attention right i don't have to keep looking at it and checking if it needs attention the thing just says i need attention right now i'll go and deal with it and come back right one of the advantages of that model is it kind of frees you up to drop this code into other code as long as it's not already sort of making use of these interrupts or making use of these timers you can start to think of dropping this interrupt uh, code into other programs essentially as is because you know if you think about a model like you know let's say we wanted to uh, play this song while doing something else while you know doing any of the other programs we've written over the past few weeks maybe that fire monitor program that we wrote that was so horrifying um we would uh oh hello music um we would need to sort of think about, you know, where in my loop do I want to check whether the time has elapsed and I need to toggle the pin. And I'm going to need to call that code fairly often because if this is, you know, if this is supposed to be vibrating at 800 hertz, I need to be checking in with that variable, that count, that millis function, or really the micros function, at least 800 times a second, or I'm going to miss a transition and that, that pin's not going to toggle and the sound's going to start to sound weird. By doing this with an interrupt, I just know that every time it's time for that pin to to change my code's gonna pause itself for a brief second i'm gonna go over i'm gonna change that pin and come right back to my code right that's the beauty of doing these things with interrupts and timers is they're basically taking care of themselves for themselves in the background um, which lets you drop in this code to to other interesting things and i'll show you an example get this out of the way here is this how the music for old video games is created essentially yeah um I'll, you a lot of them um, a lot of the older video game systems, as I understand them, um, had dedicated sound chips that were essentially doing this, right? Creating combinations of square waves or sometimes using lookup tables to, to and, and a DAC, like one of those digital to analog converters to create something more like a sine wave or a polyphonic sound. Uh, so you wouldn't necessarily be generating the sound in like, you know, a Sega Saturn directly in the processor itself, you often want to have an outboard chip and your processor would say like, okay, now play uh, sound, uh, sound 31 
uh, every 56 milliseconds and loop that until I tell you to stop. Um, and on top of that, play this drum sound every 112 milliseconds and play that indefinitely. So they had a sort of structure built into these dedicated sound chips. Um, and this is, this is not like a sound card, right, in your computer now, which like is responsible for some of the same things. Um, it's literally just a chip that was dedicated to holding little samples of essentially analog data, and the processor would ask it to play certain sequences of them either once or over and over again or so on. This is certainly the way that some of my <laughs> some of my first music was written. Um, one of my fondest programming memories was sitting in my middle school math teacher's classroom uh, at lunch, uh, writing code in QBasic on her on her computer, and we'd write just just awful little chip tune songs. Um, so this that I've been setting up here that you might remember um, is the snake game demo that, that we spent all of, I think, episode six building in a kind of uh, <laughs> a wordy way, I think is fair to say. Um, but we can turn this back off on the stuff in here. Palmer says the, the sound chip would get occasional triggers and run on its own. Yeah, exactly. And the... And this is, this is not my area of expertise. There is a, a really neat YouTube channel whose name escapes me who does like breakdowns of how he was a video game developer in the late 90s does some nice breakdowns in this kind of technology um but in addition to like triggering little samples the cpu might be responsible for um especially for a longer music file of transferring sound information from the rom the, the cartridge or the cd or whatever it is to the sound chip to play um and and but but wouldn't necessarily have to do that as fast as the actual sound samples were updating right so the the processor might still need to have an interrupt every four milliseconds to go and move the next 16 bytes of data from a sound file into the sound chip, but then it would take care of playing them on its own. Um, and for certain repetitive sounds, there are ways of, like I said, condensing that to say, okay, here's your next scope of, if you have a song like in Sonic the Hedgehog, and a song might be generous there that has like a melody to it, you might need to be shoveling in bytes for the melody, but the drum track could be a single chunk of things that could be repeated or something like that. That's that's, that's sort of my understanding of it. Um, like I say, not, 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 I'm too young for that to be my area of expertise. Um, so let's see, sir. So you might, you might remember this here, this here snake game that we built so long ago. Oops. Why did you turn off? What's happening here? Have I shorted something? Oh no. Show that table. Uh, what have I done? That, oh, maybe I just have a bad connection here. That seems more likely. There we go. There we go. There's our snake game. Oh, I probably need to do a little lighting adjustment so we can see that. There we go. Yeah. Move that out of the way here. So if you weren't here, we spent a good chunk of episode six building out this here. This here snake game. <laughs> is the power supply on, Palmer? That is, that is a, a fair question. I can't tell you, oh, and I clearly have a few loose wires on here as well because it's, I, I pulled this out of the, uh, the old project box not too long ago. Let's see if I can crash into myself. There we go. Oh, sad. Oh, there should be, clearly this column is a little bit, there it is. <laughs> a little bit janky there. But in any case, this is Snake Game um, that we built together. And the, the point I want to make with it is let's look at the code for it together as well. Um, because as you might recall from the day we did the demo of it, it's kind of intense. Um, Let's see. So this, there is a, a version of this upload to the website if you're playing along at home. Um, I think it's called Snake Music, which kind of gives away the game of uh, what we're going to do with it in a second here. Um, but there's a lot going on in this code. We have uh, multiple lines going to the shift register that feeds data to the snakes. Um, we have four input buttons. Um, we have a, a, a polling loop that tells us how often we need to be updating the state, the state of where the snake is. We have a bunch of variables for where the snake is. We have a bunch of data that encodes how the the uh, how the the state of that array is held and how we're going to configure it. Like we spent a good long time um, writing all this code. Um, but it still works. The, the board <laughs> works when the connections all work. But here's the point I want to make, right? So I know I'm using the millis function in this code and the micros function to sort of check up on when I need to update things. But I'm not using any pulls with modulation and I'm not using uh, any um, any servos or any additional libraries that use timers one and two, which means I can make use of them to do other things like play music. So what I've done here is literally just, all I did was copy and paste, you know, the initial code the setup code and uh, one function that just like sets up my interrupts down here into this snake game code and it just runs. Here, I'll show you. 
right? So let me take my take my buzzer here. Zoom out just a little bit. I'm trying to stay a little zoomed in to be candid because uh, the the workbench is is just a mess. Um, but you know, I don't think that's terribly a surprise to anyone. Um, one thing I did have to do, right? So the the functionality of automatically toggling this pin on and off relies on it being on line, right? A specific pin on the hardware of the board. So I had to move one of my buttons to another pin that I wasn't using and I rewrite that that particular variable there. Um, but now when I plug this buzzer in, I turn my turn my cool grooves off. There we go. Let me reset this here. Oops. Button came loose from the board there. Now I'm like, I really want to win. But you can see how sort of using timers and interrupts to make this happen freed us of the need to have to integrate uh, any sort of new code into the logic of the code itself, right? Like this is there's a, a fairly complex bit of logic that determines okay which way is the snake gonna move and which button presses are allowable and what happens when the snake runs into a wall and various things and runs into itself. But I didn't have to worry about any of that because I know by configuring these timers right to sort of handle their own timing and automatically toggle this buzzer at the appropriate frequency, it can all just run in the background, right? And uh, and that's it's a, a nice way to do things because, I, like I say, I need to be updating the state of the pin connected to that buzzer really pretty frequent, frequent, <laughs> really pretty frequency, pretty frequently, right? You know, a, a few hundred times a second. I don't want to have to worry that like I'm going to get stuck in some logic for you know 10 milliseconds and now I've missed a transition and I have a, an audio glitch. Um, song from the original Game Boy, yeah, it's true. I mean, clearly not the music for the original Snake game for sure. Here, I'll show you how my games of Snake always end is with sad. Um, but this is a really cool factor of, of, in, of, uh, of these timers is that they can do things sort of automatically at regular intervals for you, like play tones, like do things with a servo motor, um, like trigger interrupts and, and things like that. And by, by especially using that timer, that CTC mode, that compare, uh, that clear on timer compare mode, um, you can have things that sort of change in frequency over time. I'm actually really chuffed with how this demo came out and how good this song is. Um, <laughs> I mean, good is all relative, I suppose, but but given the amount of time, so this ended up being, you know, to encode this song into an array format. Suppose I could, I, but my first thought was to write like a general purpose MIDI to Arduino array data, like decoder program. But I ended up just sort of typing this all in by hand, <laughs> right? So that's the first note, how many eighths notes long it is. The second note is one eighth note. The third note is one eighth note and so on. There's some silence in there as well. Anyway, I had a great time making this and I hope, I hope it's fun for you. Feel free to download that code and play around with it as well. Um, could the code trigger a fail sound when the sad face appeared? Ooh, that's a cool idea. Yeah, let's do that as let's do that as our final demo of the night. I think that'll be kind of interesting. Um, I'm gonna power this off for the second while we build this. Oh, you're over. Ah, oh, the cameras. You're all. You're over here. Hi, everybody. Um, and let's turn the cool grooves back on. So let's see where I'm gonna have to a little bit remember how this code worked. Um, but I'm pretty sure I have a variable called game. Find game over check game state if not game over do a thing here we go else game over is to show game over all right so, so this is where i'm just if i'm if game if i'm in a game over state i'm going to do this sort of thing um and so here is where i'm going to want to change the sound um so how am i going to implement that so first i'm going to need to come up with some kind of sad sound for it to play let's do that part first um i'm going to say const int um, and let's make it something relatively easy to write. Um, we'll call this sad sound. Um, and we'll say, um, we'll just sort of write a few notes and, and see if it sounds like anything. And even if it doesn't, frankly, we might just move on. Um, say note F4. Um, we'll make these each eighth notes. Oh, and by the way, so the reason that these can be written as sort of note F4 as opposed to having to type in a specific frequency or delay is I'm including this secondary file here, and this is also on the website, um, that basically t says, hey, whenever this, whenever Jeff writes note B0, that means 31 hertz. Whenever he says note G3, that means 196 hertz. This file I just straight up stole from the tone examples that are in the Arduino IDE. I think the licensing is still in the top here. Um, 
But this is just a, a nice, easy shorthand, so I'm not constantly having to refer back to individual numbers and can sort of think of these as, as notes. Um, so let's see, note E4, eighth note, note D4, eighth note, note C4, uh, eighth note times five. We'll see if that sounds like any good. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to, for the time being, uh, I'm just going to, uh, let's see. I'm going to comment out my previous song and just have it play that sad sound over and over and over again so we can see what it sounds like. So we'll call this our tone list. All right, that looks good. All right, let's upload. Oh, I'm going to need to get my, my little dingly dongle out here so I can upload this code. This we talked about before, the Pro Minis don't have an, an internal um, USB to serial converter, so you have to supply one um, when you're programming it. Where's my programming cable? I'm going to let you, you can all infer how messy the desk is by how long it takes to find a singular USB cable on it, but it's fine. <laughs> all right, so we'll plug, plug the USB converter in, plug that into the Arduino. Oops, we'll plug that into the Arduino. There we go. Plug that back in, and we will select our serial port. I believe is now COM4, and we are on a Pro Mini, and we will upload. Oop, I made a typo, as I always do. We'll see what happens when that uploads. So that's our sad sound over and over again. It probably needs to be in a minor key, but that'll be fine. We'll play that like once and call it done. Um, I'll unplug that for uh, just a second here. I'm just going to unplug the buzzer. That seems like an easier way to do it. So now I have this sad sound. So let's let's bring back our original music. Um, and um, what I will do is I'll call this this array my sad sound array. And I will make this, instead of a D4, I'll make that a C-sharp 4. I don't know if that's going to sound like anything, but I'm not a music person. Um, so let's scroll down to where our where we're playing our sound here. Um, and what I want is, I want to, when I trigger this game over state, I really want my, um, I want my notes and my times to be referencing not my tone list, but my sad sound um uh so what i think i would do, there's a couple ways i could do this one would be to um use a pointer and i think that's what we'll do um and i i haven't tried this in advance so we'll see we'll see if i goof this up but hopefully i don't um if, if not we'll do it sort of the manual way but we'll say um int pointer song pointer uh and we'll say in our setup loop we'll say song pointer equals tone list the music setup here yeah so song pointer equals tone equals the address of tone list the song pointer is going to point at my tone list and when i reference that data um i'm going to say instead of tone list i'm going to say song pointer uh song pointer tone index time periods i think this all works the only thing that doesn't work is this max tone function but we'll deal with that in a second here uh let's see current to const int to int assignment song pointer equals address of tone list int pointer song pointer this might be uh, did I just, did I typo it? Is that how this happened? Song pointer equals address of tone list. Actually, oh, because tone list is an array, I can just set them equal to each other. I think. Let's find out. Plug my buzzer back in. All right, so we're still playing, we're still playing our music as designed. So that's a good sign. So the pointer, this is, again, my, my, my entire theory is like, if you're going to change something, do it in steps. And first, as you're going to build a new structure, do the same thing in a different way. So now I have a pointer pointing at where my data is um, instead of referencing it directly. Great. 
so now, now that I have that pointer pointing at that list, what's cool is um, when my game over happens, I can um, I can just point that pointer to the new sound data. Where was that? Um, i going to find that place where I set that game over variable. Oh, it's down at the end of my loop here. If game over, change the sound. So I'm going to say sound pointer equals sad sound. And then, the, then I have to update how many terms are in that array, how many things I actually have. So I'll say size of sad sound, size of sad sound one, right? So now, so this will, when I go to that game over screen, I'm gonna say, hey, uh, point this pointer, not at the list of music sounds, but at the array that holds my sad sounds in it. Um, and I'm gonna need to update this variable that says how long that array is. And so what I hope will happen is when I go to that frowny face screen, instead of playing the Tetris music, it'll play that sad sound over and over again. And then we can deal with I only want, the fact that I only want it to play once. Let's upload that. Uh, Sound pointer not declared in this scope. Did I make another typo? I called it song pointer. That would do it. Come down to song pointer and upload that. All right, we'll see if this works. All right, uploading. Plug our buzzer back in. Oh, and I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to die. <laughs> Uh, I might need to have a longer snake to make that happen. There we go. Oh, my buttons are popping out. There we go. Crash. Can you hear that? Oh, good, Palmer. I'm so glad. Yeah, it's it's just like a good practical problem solving thing. So you can, we've gone to that that kind of sad sound, I suppose. Um. Yeah. So that's a that's a great sign. Um, so just to, just to recap what's happening there, right? So, um, when my, the, what's, what's playing the actual notes, right? Is that the timer one is reset, is, uh, is resetting itself many, many times a second. And it's resetting itself whenever timer one is counting up to a value. And that value is being calculated based on the frequency that I want to, the note to play at. So I'm basically taking sort of one over the frequency and I'm getting the period of how long each note should be, right? So I'm storing that value in this OCR1 register that we saw earlier. Whenever my timer gets to there, I'm, I'm just, I have it configured to toggle that pin back and forth and that's just playing the sound. Um, so the data that it's looking at to determine what those frequencies are is what's stored in an array. What array? Well, it's the array pointed to by this song pointer. And I start with that song pointer pointed at my big fat Tetris song, my tone list array, right? But when uh, when I have my game over, wow, this is just so much code. When I have my game over, I point my song pointer to my sad sound array. And then I update this other variable that says how long the array is so I know when I need to loop back to the beginning. And I change my display state, of course, too, that, that shows that sad face. Um, so here, here's what I need. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, here's what I'll do. Um, so I, well, here's what I want. I, I don't want this to loop, or maybe I want it to only loop twice. Uh, let's, let's say I don't want it to loop. What I'm going to do is modify this piece of code that's responsible for the looping. Let's get those jams back on. Um, so that's what this is here, right? So every time I need to change notes, I'm, I'm keeping track of my place in my array of sounds in this, in, in, uh, in my array here with this variable called tone index. You know, where in my array am I? What note am I on? I mean, every time I go to a new note, I step two places ahead in the array because I need a place for the frequency and a place for the duration, right? And I say, if I'm past the end of my array, if my index is greater than the maximum number I'm allowed to go, just go back to zero. So I'm gonna modify that a little bit here. Um, if I get to the end of it, um, if I'm not in a game over state, I think game over was not capitalized, then tone index goes back to zero. So if I'm just playing the game, I want the Tetris music to loop. But if I am in a game over state, then uh, I'm going to disable the speaker by turning off the bit that, automatic, that says automatically toggle that pin, which I'm going to have to go look up, but that may also be useful. So here's what I want. Oh, I'm on the right page already. That's <laughs> that's convenient. Um, so in my in my timer one 
control register A. I have these variables that control whether the timers are sort of automatically hooked to these output pins. All right, so TCC R1A is gonna be our register. And I know I have it set up. I'm in, uh, let's see, I'm in non-PWM mode. I'm just, I'm not doing any, any PWMing. I'm gonna have it toggling on compare match. So I have COM1A0 set to one. So I want um, else TCC, TCC R1A, and I wanna turn that bit off. So I'm gonna do uh, and equals not the value of, uh, what is that? COM1A0, COM1A0, right? So uh, now what else do I need to do here? So I think, I think actually I should do two slightly different things. So if um, this will stop the speaker from playing anything, but this loop is still gonna happen. Um, and I, I don't really want to be referencing data that's outside of my array, right? So if, if I don't set this tone index back to zero, I'm going to keep looking for information sort of past the end of my array. I'm not going to really do anything with it, but it's still bad form to be sort of looking past the bounds of my array as my array goes on to infinity. So what I actually should do here is, you know, if I'm past my maximum tone, reset to zero anyway. And then if I'm in a game over state just disable the buzzer. So we'll continue to sort of loop through that in the background, but the, the speaker will be off, so we shouldn't really care. Let's see if that compiles. I have a feeling I've, yeah, game over had a capital O in it. Yeah, okay, so that compiles really well. And by, and by really well, I suppose I mean it compiles. I'm gonna plug my buzzer back in here. Um, and let's upload our code, pause the cool jams. And we'll see what happens. So come to the table here. Got our cool game of snake. Maybe I'll adjust the lighting a little bit. All right, let's go eat. Let's go eat a couple of uh, apples or berries or flashing mice. Also, I'm remembering. So in the last version of the code that we wrote back in like lesson six, I placed a couple of invisible obstacles in the map. So that's why the snake sometimes sort of randomly stops in the middle of its path. Now if I crash myself here, here we go. Oops, nope, missed myself. Can't can't lose for losing. All right, go that way. And now this way. Ah, so that was interesting. Did anyone hear that? So it finished out the last note it was playing uh, and then jumped to the sad sound, which is good. And I'm, st I'm looping the sad sound forever, which is also not what I want. So some progress. Let's see if we can fix it a little bit here. We're... we're shorter than we have been in some previous weeks. So let's do this one more pass on this and see what we learn. I'm gonna unplug that buzzer again for now. So let's see, so why didn't that work? Let's make sure, probably the disabling of the buzzer is something to do with how I'm setting these configuration bits. Um, let's go back up to the top here, get the cool jams going and double check what my configuration bits actually are. Um, here we go. So this is where I'm setting my mode to CTC mode. So I basically want to do the opposite of this. Uh, so let's let's see what that actually code is. TCC R1A uh, and equals not. Oh, you know what it might be? Is I'm not sure I'm still calling the check music note function after the game over is, has happened. Um, so I might, uh, no, let's see, is that true? No, I must be because I'm resetting that tone index function back to zero. We're still looping through things. If game over, TCC R1A not equals value COM1A0. Could be disabling that. Re-enabling it somewhere. Interesting. All right, well, let's come back to that in a second. Let's fix the was really when I what I will do is this. So let's go back to that code that like checks if we're in a game over state, which is or that sets up our initial conditions when we have a game over. So else if over equals true. Ah, uh, is this my display function? Set in direction, check game state. Ah, so this is not actually where I'm if we have a game over. This is just the display function 
before game over. Uh, okay, so this is actually not where I want this code. I don't want I don't want to mix up my music generation code into the code that's like controlling the state of the. I want to keep this separated out. So let's go down into my my uh, music generation code down here. Let's see where it was. It check music note. Ah, uh, okay. So uh, really, what I want is if game over. This is not. What I really want is to like do this wherever the game decides I'm gonna be in a game over state. And it's wherever game over gets set to true. So it's here. If a snake is intersecting itself, um, this is where I'd want to configure um, set game over music. Let's just define ourselves a new function and we can do this somewhere else. Um, and I think there's somewhere else where I declare a game over state. Um, ah. So actually, this, this if game over equals true is redundant. That's just if, because I'm outside of this game over state function here. So really, when it's time, when the snake hits itself, we're going to call this set game over music function in addition to some other things. Um, and in that function, oops, let's do some stuff. Now, I could put this code right, because we're only going to a game over state at one place in our code. I could slam this code in there, but I think breaking it out into a separate function is going to keep things a little bit cleaner. Um, so what did I need to do here? I need to say... Uh, song pointer equals sad sound, um, and, uh, what is that? Oops. TCCR1A not, uh, and equals the negation of bit value of COM1A0, I think. COM1A0, yes. And then it will continue to loop, um, Oh, except that's going to, uh, that's not what I want. Set game over music is going to just set. Oh, and this is, this is the place where I need to set my maximum length of my array. I'm going to point to the new array and say, okay, how long is it? Okay, it's this long now. So I don't need to have this in my check music note function, which is still getting called all the time. Um, we're still looping through our loop. Um. And then here's where I want to do this. So I think that's right. I think it is. I know I'm, I'm kind of muttering to myself. This is what like a lot of afternoons in the in the, in the office here <laughs> sound and look like for me. All right, but let's see. Let's see what happens there. Really, if I was going to get deep into this, what I probably would start with is making a button that just ends the game, um, so that I could test this a little more quickly. But that's all right. Let's see here. Crash. Still looping forever. All right, let's give it one more college try. I see we're right on the two hour mark. Let's give it one more college try. And then I want to preview for you what we're doing in the next two weeks. Um, so let's see. If game over, TCCR1A. Oh, you're over here. Hi. TCCR1A equals not BV. Did I, am I just setting this wrong? I might be. Oh. Ah, that's what's happening here. I'm not actually using CTC mode. I'm using this com this comparison. I'm doing it as a comparison. That's weird. Why would I do that? So, uh, so just to be clear, what I what I think I'm seeing is that rather than ha using this built-in functionality where it sort of toggles the pin in the background for me, I think I am just. Oh no, I'm using CTC mode. And then I'm also enabling that compare match interrupt. Why would I do that? This is like, hey, every time the timer, you know, hits this value, change the value on that pin. And then I also wrote an interrupt that every time it hits that value, change the value on that pin. That seems redundant to me, but maybe there's something I'm missing. Now we're still playing music. Ah, but you know... That would be what it was, because in addition to turning off that CTC mode, I, Jeff Glass, had written an interrupt that was manually toggling things as well. That was not as desired. Let's try that again.
Interesting. Now it's not playing at all. Oh, you know what I might need to do? One more little thing. Uh, is, um, uh, yeah, so I think this is what's happening. So all my says is if my opponent is past the end of my array, then uh, loop back to the beginning, and if it's game over time, turn the buzzer off. Um, but I know where do I, when I transition to the sad song, do I reset my tone index, right? So when, I, when it's time for a game over, I want to point at the new song, I want to say how long that new array is, and I want to start over at the beginning. And I set my tone index to zero. I think that will help a great deal. All right, let's see if that helps. I'll be, <laughs> to be totally honest, so I I was debating how much time to take, like, programming this Tetris song in for the sake of this demo, but now I'm really glad I did the full, like, verse and chorus because it's preventing me from going too insane while testing this. So I think we're, I think we're all winners here. Seems like we only got three sounds there. Let's try that one more time. Yeah, I'm like weirdly missing a sound. Maybe I've maybe I've typoed something somewhere. Yeah, so not perfect, right? So something's still a little weird, you know, but I think that's a, a decent enough proof of concept for us to call it for tonight. Um, and uh, I'll call that example at least for tonight to show you. So that was actually Palmer. Thank you so so much that actually turned out to be a really cool example um so just to like just to recap some things that we got to use there right we got to we sort of just smashed our song playing program and this giant snake program together because by using timers we know they're not going to conflict too much um and then we we used some state of our program some you know if we're in this game over state based on the state of this variable if things are true we go back in and in the middle of our program reconfigure how our timers work and this is actually it's kind of of a cool thing a lot of times you think about like timers or something that you would set up at the beginning of your code to dim something or play some sound or something but this is a really good example of like okay when i'm in this certain state i need the timers to be doing this doing analog rights doing pwm doing servo control doing playing the tetris song or the sad sound but in this other mode in this other state based on these variables i i no longer want to do that i want these timers to do this other thing i need to reconfigure them totally a thing you can do in the middle of your program like we did here Thank you, Palmer. That turned out to be really cool. Um, so anyway, so that's that's the gist of timers. They count up. You control how fast they count up. They have interrupts when they overflow and when they hit certain values. And you can make them automatically do some things with some pins and throw some interrupts when uh, when they do it. That's the gist of it. Questions, comments, issues, concerns? I'm going to wrap at you about the next few weeks so I get you out of here before a double Jeff Glass 90 minutes. Um, but, but throw in questions as you have them. Happy to play and do some more demos. Um, but let's talk about the next couple of weeks, y'all. Um, so here's what I'm thinking. I think it was, um, oh, this is timers again. I think it was Chris who said last week, or maybe Palmer, I mean, maybe both of you, like, I, I, I feel ya that the past three weeks have been dense. <laughs> like, and I, 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 I usually use a kinder word than that, but like, it would feel a, like it's, it's a lot to process, especially on a Sunday night. Like, oh, he's got these math and he's got this exclusive war and all this code. It, it, it's, this is not the perfect learning environment for actually ingesting all this stuff. And so, you know, these really dense ones can be, uh, it's a lot to process. Like, I totally get that, especially when some guy on the screen drones on for three hours. Right. So, so it'd be nice to have a, a slightly, let's say, um, softer topic for next week. So here's what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to talk about stuff. We're going to talk about stuff you can have. Um, Palmer, I think, mentioned ages ago, maybe in the DMX episode, or I forget, we were using a shield for something. I think Palmer said, like, oh, a shield. Like, well, let's talk more about shields and, and things and common things that attach to boards and do stuff. Um, and I think that's a great idea. So we're going to talk about um, mostly where to find interesting parts, components, modules, boards, servos. Um, 
you know, look at some of the common hobby suppliers, the robotic suppliers, various interesting things. Um, so, so that'll be like in the, uh, on that side of the world, some, some cool modules there. And by the way, I welcome anyone who's like, oh, I know this super cool supplier um, or this super cool part. I, I think it's not possible to drop links in the chat. I think it blocks you, but I'm gonna see if we can set up like some kind of form where if you're like, you should take a look at this thing. Here's a link. Let's look at it and we'll dig through. We can start, or, or here's an interesting looking thing. What is it saying? How do you control it? Uh, some, some of the problems, like a lot of the reason that like Adafruit and Sparkfront are great is they do really good documentation. Not everyone does really good documentation. So if you're like, how does this module want me to control it? We can dig into that. Um, so that'll be sort of one half of next week, which I think will be a lot of fun. And the other is um, we'll sort of look at the other end of the spectrum of like parts suppliers, like where you would buy like resistors from and capacitors and things. Um, and specifically because, and just to, just to give you a, a brief preview of somewhere like DigiKey, which is where I order a lot of my components from. Um, it's a, you know, it's like DigiKey has, has everything. And there's lots of DigiKey, Mouser, New York, there's a bunch of these. We'll look at a few um, when we get into them next week. But like, let's say you need some resistors. So I come down here and I click on resistors um, and I want some through hole resistors. Well, uh, DigiKey on the base list has, Let's see here. Uh, 511,000. Ooh, it's gone away again. 511,676 different resistors that you can buy. How in the whole heck are you supposed to sort through half a million resistors to find what you need? And what are the different parameters that you might put in to narrow down what you need? Um, so I want to spend just a little bit of time, like showing how to navigate a couple of sites like this um, because they really do have everything and they're super powerful and I and they they're worth pushing through the you know there is like an intimidation factor here just with the number of options we're going to hit at least for some common components like the most common options and what they mean so you can start to navigate these places because you know if you need you know a bulk pack of assorted resistors to work on a workbench Amazon eBay AliExpress sure when you need you know a five watt 120 ohm termination resistor as a uh, the end of a line for a signal you probably want to be buying it from a, a decent supplier it'll cost you know, a couple bucks but how do you find that part when you need it or that connector that you need um, i want to talk about connectors next week too because like how you connect your projects to things can be super important um so that's like our slightly softer topic for next week i'm super jazzed to like honestly rip a bunch of stuff out of my bins find some cool stuff on websites i want to hear what you guys have like found seen used dug up google in the next week that kind of thing so that'll be a lot of fun I also want to introduce the idea for what I want to do, I think, in a couple of weeks. Um, this one's a little bit more, a little bit more wishy-washy, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a sec. Um, at some point, I want to talk about Raspberry Pis. Um, you hear them mentioned in conjunction with Arduino a lot, and there's good reason. They're sort of low-priced, computery, electronics-y things, um, but they're not at the end of the day, all that similar. You can use them to do similar things, but they have sort of different strengths and weaknesses. Um, they're also a lot of fun and they're really cheap. Um, so I thought that might be a fun a fun companion thing to play with, talk about some programming there, talk about some uses of them. The reason it's a little bit like, a little bit hedgy about whether that's gonna happen in two weeks or a later date um, is because, so to, to show how a Raspberry Pi is set up, um, what I would really like is to use, you know, use the nice camera view and like, Actually, I think I, I put my Raspberry Pis away, but like, you know, show on the table how it's hooked up and then use another HDMI capture card to show the video coming off of the HDMI connection. And I haven't actually tried to see if I can do capture for, you know, this camera and capture for the Raspberry Pi at the same time. I think I can, um, but there might be some troubleshooting that I have to do there. Um, so if, if that takes some time, the Raspberry Pi episode might get pushed back another week or two. Um, and by episode, I mean <laughs> episode, evening, bash whatever we want to call them um that might that, that i think is a sort of a crucial part of, of having that be a valuable thing so if that takes a little longer then we'll find something else to do in two weeks all this to say if you want to play along with some of those weeks um and not everything we do because we're, we're i think we're going to talk a little bit about python programming and web programming those you can do on, on sort of any computer but if you want to play along with the raspberry pi stuff i wanted to sort of call this out early in case anyone wanted to order one um for the kind of stuff that we're going to talk about like how is it different from an arduino why would you use a raspberry pi what do you need to get started um any of the different Raspberry Pi variants will work. The newest ones are the Raspberry Pi 4s. They're pretty powerful and a little bit pricey. Like I want to say the base model with a gigabyte of RAM is like 30 bucks. I mean, it's, I guess it's as much as an Arduino board, but like the zero and the zero W. So the zero is a little tiny form factor one, which I thought I had on my desk here, but I'm not going to bother to tummy cam it. Oh, oh, here. I know where it is. There we go. Yeah, there we go. 
So this is a this is a zero and a zero W. They are they're little tiny single board computers that run Linux. Um, the zero W has Wi-Fi built into it. Um, the zero, if you want network connectivity, you have to attach and like an external Ethernet dongle. Um, so if you're looking to like get a board to play with for these things, the zero W is a relatively inexpensive choice. Um, you would add to it a power supply, um, a mini HDMI to HDMI connector. A mini HDMI to full size HDMI if you want to plug this into a monitor, um, and you need an SD card to put the operating system on. So the full kit costs 30, 35 bucks, including the board. So anyway, I wanted to mention this in case someone wanted to like order one and get it on their desk and, and play along with us in the meantime. Don't feel pressured to feel tune into those and just like you know enjoy and learn about what a Raspberry Pi is. And like I say, once we get into like the nitty gritties of like how you do GPIO, digital write, analog write on something like a Raspberry Pi, all that I think will be in Python, which you can set up either on Windows or on Mac as well. So if, if you'd rather play along like that, also good. Or if you're just like sitting in your underwear, watching these at home, looking at this, this beautiful face, like that is also always a perfectly valid way to enjoy these evenings. Nothing is wrong out there. Um, oh yeah, Chris points out Micro Center has these on sale. Fry's had them for a while too, although I think Fry's Electronics is probably, probably dying. Um, but yeah, if you go to a place like Micro Center or, um, you know, get, get this, get a two amp power supply, maybe a little case, a little cheapy plastic case if you want one. Um, you can also buy kits uh, on Amazon or at Micro Center or wherever um, that have all the various bits and bobs. They're usually a little overpriced for what the kit is, but it's really not terribly hard. So, so there's that. Um, that's the next two weeks, y'all. I think it's going to be fun. I'm, I know that like the Raspberry Pi stuff is like a little bit of a diversion for where we've been so far, but I think it'll be a really nice companion to like illustrating like why, why is the Arduino, what is the Arduino good at? We've talked about what it can do. Why would you choose a platform like this over anything else? And why would you choose a Raspberry Pi to do, to, to do something? Um, what is it good at? What can we throw this project at? And frankly, the, the fact that this is a $10 board and it can do as much as it can is, like 2020 is is well absent everything 2020 technologically is an amazing time to live that's why i think we're, we're going to leave it for tonight um as always y'all thank you so much for spending these sunday nights here um it really is a joy to like share and teach and and share some of the stuff with you all um yeah, it's funny. I think I said it started tonight. I was coming into this like a little bit tired and a little bit shaken. And I feel still a little bit scatterbrained. Um, but I come out of these like always feeling excited uh, and and invigorated by the questions and the and the building stuff together. It's something I, I have missed these past few months. And this has been a real joy. So I hope you're staying safe out there. I hope you're washing your hands. Um, I hope it's always like it is a privilege to be here. And I hope you're using this chance to build some strength to go out and do the things that we need to do in the world these days. And, it, and if that is just gives you the strength to go and hydrate and then go back to bed, that is fine, right? We're all doing the best we can as long as we're staying safe these days. Um, Y'all are great. Y'all are tremendous. Uh, we'll be back next Sunday, 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time, right here on YouTube. The information will be on uh, Jeff.Glass has electronics, advance in ad electronics Bash in advance and find me on Twitter at Jeffers Glass. I'll stop now. Y'all are great. You know it. Stay safe. I'll see you next week.